Good evening, and welcome to the Tuesday, April 24th, Issaquah City Council Committee of the Whole Council meeting. Uh, we have four items on the agenda this evening. And uh, for those who don't know, Committee of the Whole is for generally informational items. This is something that uh, might otherwise come to an individual committee, but is coming to a committee that is all of us. And we hold this meeting four times a year. So we have uh, ID 0261 I-90 Auxiliary Lane Project with Kathy George from the Washington State Department of Transportation. Welcome. Thank you. Do you have a plug in anywhere? Sorry about that. Um, hi, Kathy George with Washington State Department of Transportation. I'm the engineering manager over uh, Connecting Washington program. Um, Sheldon asked me to show up and give you a briefing on our uh, I-90 Eastgate to SR900 corridor improvement project. Uh, I know a few of you were at the open house we had last summer. Um, projects mm -hmm. changed a little bit, including the name of the project. Um, so. Uh, purpose today is to give you an update on uh, what's changed and what we're going to be presenting at the, at the uh, open house uh, tomorrow night. So uh, when we were at the open house, I'm not loud enough? No. <laughs> at the open house last summer, uh, we presented a project that was going to be PQ shoulders. So what PQ shoulders were, were we were restriping the highway and then the outside shoulder, which would then be 14 foot wide, would be a driving lane during the peak period. The peak shoulders went from SR 900 to Eastgate in the westbound direction, and in the eastbound direction, it went from Eastgate to Westlake Sammamish Parkway. Uh, after some, an, some further analysis and input from our stakeholder advisory group, which includes uh, Sheldon and uh, some of the uh, other stakeholders, uh, Sound Transit, um, uh, Sammamish, um, and, and Metro, uh, we're coming back with a, a modified project that includes auxiliary lanes. So. Similarly, a restripe of the highway, but we're going to keep the outside shoulder uh, between uh, Westlake Sammamish Parkway and Eastgate. We'll have an auxiliary lane that will be adjacent to the outside shoulder, so you'll have a full eight to 12 foot outside shoulder, <clears throat> an 11 foot auxiliary lane next to it um, that anyone can drive in 24 seven. And then uh, the remaining lanes out there HOV lane on the inside, and then the inside shoulder will be reduced to four foot uh, minimum. Uh, in the opposite direction, uh, we'll be doing the same thing, uh, be also between the same limits, uh, and um, then between, oh, I don't know exactly, about a 3,700 foot um, extended off-ramp to Westlake Sammamish Parkway. So what that ends up doing, and that will also be with a full shoulder on the outside, what that ends up doing is pulling some of the traffic out of the congestion earlier, so there'll be a more reliable speed for westbound drivers in the morning. So uh, to answer a question I anticipate you're gonna ask me, why aren't we going all the way to SR 900? As part of our analysis, uh, we determined that uh, due to uh, increases in traffic, especially on I-405, that um, we've, we're getting more congestion there than we had before. Uh, also additional traffic coming for along I-90. And if we started the auxiliary lane or the PQ shoulder, they, they pretty much behave the same, but you know, different hours. Um, we were going to get the, the congestion to 405 a lot faster 
and everybody was going to end up with a slower trip that way. Um, so this kind of leaves a meter, not so much a ramp meter, but without the additional lane, kind of meters traffic down so it, we don't throw all the traffic um, at 405 at once. Um, a few years ago, I don't know if anyone was familiar with our old secretary, Doug McDonald. He likened it to, you know, pouring rice slowly through a funnel or pour, pouring it all at once. If you pour it all at once, it kind of clogs up and nothing goes through. So it's not exactly the same thing, but, but pretty similar. So next thing I want to talk to you about are our noise walls. Noise walls, we've got four noise walls that we're uh, putting out along I-90. They're the same ones that were at uh, the open house last summer. Um, on the south side, we've got one starting uh, at basically where the houses start going westbound at the south end of the lake, and it extends to the Westlake Sammamish Parkway uh, off-ramp on the, so that's on the north side. On the south side, we've got two noise walls uh, that um, protect uh, the uh, condominium apartment buildings on the south side in the Westlake Sammamish Parkway area. And then uh, in the Bellevue area, uh, west of Westlake Sammamish Parkway, we have got a retaining, or not a retaining, but a noise wall that pretty much follows the path, uh, the, the bike path, and uh, protects the homes to the north. Um, and these were determined after doing analysis that uh, looked at, um, um, number one, if we put up a wall, um, were there homes that were above um, 66 uh, dBA uh, decibels? Um, and then if there were, then we put together noise walls. It, number one, was it reasonable, or not reasonable, feasible to block the noise? So could we actually put up something that would block the noise? And if we could, then there's the reasonableness. How much is the cost? And we have statewide policy on how much you can spend per receptor. And um, so the walls that um, are proposed um, met both those criteria. Uh, the wall on the, on the south side um, uh, west of uh, Westlake Spanish Parkway interchange did not. So when we go to the open house uh, tomorrow, one of the things that we're going to be showing the public is what these walls are going to look like. So uh, this picture is um, looking, um, this is at the south end of the lake, so um, the, the far east noise wall right in the pinch point area. Um, and this is the existing uh, look. Oh, sorry, pressed the wrong button. And this is kind of what it's going to look like. Um, same area, uh, the gravel, so we've got uh, a noise wall underneath, that's, or not a noise wall, a retaining wall underneath. That is the wall that we're putting in to uh, add space for the city to provide um, the pedestrian and bike improvements um, through the pinch point area. And then above it, the line kind of designates uh, the noise wall portion of, of uh, the wall. Um, and um, this is called an ashlar uh, pattern, and it's kind of a random brick pattern. It's one of the options we're going to be bringing to the public tomorrow. So next location, oh, and this kind of shows um, uh, the look of what's happening, um, existing cars out there, uh, the existing uh, retaining wall and fill, and then the future noise wall. What's coming out is that retaining wall and the fill behind it. Yes, Paul? For Councilman yeah, Winterstein, the, sorry. That's kind of the previous slide. Sure. 14 feet sound wall above a seven foot high retaining wall. So that'll be 21 feet high. That's correct. Okay, and how much um, uh, in, your pre in your pictures previous to that, you show the current conditions. Um, and what is the, uh, do you know with this um, design? It, it varies. How much width? we would be gaining Remind uh, on, nor on um, Northwest Sammamish Road? So I'm going to call on Masood uh, Kayenda to make sure he gets it right. Yeah, so it. Can, can you go to the microphone, Thank please? You. Thank you. Sorry. 
So my name is Masood Karanda, I'm system project engineer for this project. So if you if you not your aware, you know this that uh, I ninety is bordered. There's a barrier between I ninety and Northwest Wexel Exelamamis, right? So you go in. That's what is just a barrier between the two, and then it starts splitting, and that's the point where we start the the, the noise, uh, the retaining wall relocation. So you start from zero, you go all the way wide to eight foot, eight to ten feet, and then goes back in. So the maximum we're going to gain about eight to nine feet, where the pinch point exactly is. But we're starting way ahead over like 300, 400 feet away from it, and then it just keep widening and then go back. So the maximum are going to be about eight to nine feet. Okay, eight thank to you. Ten feet. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. At, at the open house tomorrow, are you going to have more detailed kind of overview look of that design? Uh, we're this, we're still we're, we're still working on the design. Sure. Um, okay. So that, this is probably the best we have at the moment. Okay. We're leaving it in a gravel uh, condition, and then the city's going to follow up with the project to do the paving and restriping to whatever configuration uh, community agrees on. Okay. All right. Um, and really, all I was asking, it sounds when you said starts at zero, going to go this wide, kind of come back. I was just wondering where the beginning and end points are that. Just some type of visualization. And I can wait if you don't have that now. If you had it, I was just curious. I do, I do not have it with me, but we may have something that we can bring if you want to know about where that starts. Um, I can bring something to the open house. There will house. be general curiosity about it because there's a lot of interest in this. So if you have, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mariah, do you have a question? I do. Uh, could you just speak a little bit more about the, the, the widening of the roadway in general for the future bike lanes? So with what we're looking at right there, could you talk a little bit about the bike lane in specifically? Um, I might want to. <laughs> I'm Sheldon Lynn, Director of Engineering, City of Issaquah. As I understand the question, Council Member Batiz, is that you're, you're asking what about the, what's the road section going to look like when washed out is finished with their work? It's going to look approximately like you see here in the visualization. They're going to widen it and they're going to provide us the space by which we'll be able to then work with the community and the roadway through there and determine what's the best way to put the bike lanes and the sidewalks for pedestrian mobility through that area. They're providing enough room for us to be able to put in two bike lanes and two sidewalks in addition to two travel lanes. The community, we need to work together to figure out exactly how we want that configuration to work because it could be a multitude of different things there. Thank you. No specific designs have been done yet. But Sheldon, before you go away, but that can range anywhere from, from zero to eight or nine feet? Uh, the space that they're giving us, yes, we provided them a sketch based upon our GIS system and so forth of approximately what room we would need at the largest point mm -hmm. and also some taper zones to accommodate for the roadway shifting and things like that if we needed a taper zone in there. So that's what WashDOT's working from is a sketch that we provided them from engineering on this is a space we need to correct that situation to allow pedestrian and bicycle mobility through the pinch point. If I look at that road and I say Retaining wall to shrubs, right? Mm -hmm. Width including shoulders. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be a consistent width along uh, a long length? Or when you talk about tapering on one side, does that translate to an aggregate cross section that varies along the length? The tapers end at points where the other sections of Northwest Sammamish Road should be able to accommodate a similar section. The, the difference between the pinch point area and the other sections along Sammamish Road are going to be very specifically probably in the pinch point area, there will not be any landscaping. It's going to be solid hardscape because of the tight configurations. WashDOT couldn't give us any more. We kind of pushed them as far as we could. Uh, as you can see from their graphics, it showed that basically that wall is going to be right next to the shoulder on, on their side. And so we have a steep slope and houses on the other side. So we're very confined. So Let me ask, go ahead. Sorry. Let me ask the question differently. If through public engagement, if the city decides there's a certain cross section that they like, some combination of two lanes of vehicular traffic and some combination of bicycle and pedestrian lanes, is it going to be your effort to have that, that cross section extend the entire length of this project? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. We can, uh, any other questions right now? Nope, okay, please continue. So this is an uh, existing uh, Google Street View uh, looking in the other direction from Southeast Newport Way. This is up near one of the condominiums. Um, and so this is the existing, and then the future will have a wall bit off the ways um, off of Newport. It won't be right next to Newport. Um, um, won't be right next to the freeway, so hopefully we can get plan is to put some planting in front of this on both sides. Uh, but anyways, that's a, a approximately what a driver would see. And then um, for the back side, um, we've got three different options um, that we can use. Ashlar is the one in the top left. Um, that, as I said, was an, a random brick. That picture is from, uh, it's a, a, a the back side of the noise wall on I-405, and uh, that's what they're using there. Uh, random board finish, uh, this is out, I believe, on 525, back side of the wall. And um, the third one is a granite texture finish, which I believe is out um, 527? 18? Um, and that, that would be down um, the south end of, of of uh, uh, Maple Valley. On the freeway side, we are um, putting in walls with a, a leaf pattern um, similar, and, and this is the visualization we've come up, similar to what you have at Sunset Interchange. Won't be exactly the same because uh, those were each individual, I think uh, about four by four uh, panels in, in, in a retaining wall. Um, it, not possible to do here, um, but uh, this is generally the look we're expecting. I, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so if I were to look at that stretch of road right now, there's probably an ener energy absorbing barrier, right, of some kind? Mm -hmm. um, yes, how... there'll be one in the future. Okay, so that would be in front of that would be yes. that the retaining wall doesn't act as the energy absorbing feature. Yeah, uh, not a retain, in this case, not a retaining wall, a noise wall, and Sorry, you noise definitely wall. won't if it's right next to the freeway. If it's further back um, out of our clear zone, uh, it will. And just didn't get that in the picture, but definitely there'll be, because uh, 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 I've seen cars that have gone through these before over in Seattle, so. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. And then um, this is looking westbound. Um, and this one, what in the world is that? Is that, I guess that's a, a Kind of cropped it in on top of um, an existing, an existing barrier that's out there or guardrail. So, um, project schedule: um, we expect to be under construction in the summer of 2019. Projects expected to take two years to complete. Um, plan is, and I didn't bring that. Did I bring it? No. So uh, didn't bring that slide along, but. Um, Lane closures on 990 will likely be um, uh, trying to focus it um, on times that aren't going to be disruptive to people, so during non-peak hours, but obviously noise wall, putting in drilled shafts, um, uh, some of that stuff is going to have to get done during the day or on weekends. Uh, don't don't want your your uh, adjacent property owners calling either you or us. So um, and and so that we'll be trying to avoid that and also minimizing impacts to the public. But uh, we've got uh, close to sixteen thousand feet of noise wall, <laughs> and it, it's going to take a while to put in. I think I think we were what at twelve hundred, thirteen hundred uh, different shafts that we're anticipating we'll have to put in. So. A lot of work. Um, project will also include resurfacing of some of the ramps out at Westlake Sammamish Parkway and eastbound, eastbound on 92. So um, I guess that's that's about it. Um, if I can answer any more questions. Any council members have questions? Yep. Council Member Hunt. Thank you. 
There are three possible finishes for the back of the wall and the one possible finish for the front. Um, I'm wondering, is it, um, is there a possibility for using multiple finishes depending on feedback that you get for the back or would it all, all be, all of the noise will have one front and one of the patterns on the back? I think we wanna focus on one. The more patterns you use, the, the incre increased costs associated with it. Um, probably one of the things I didn't mention is on the whole, you're probably not going to be able to see the noise wall um, from the backside, um, except from a distance. Uh, the exception is in uh, the very east end of South Cove, um, where a uh, pinch point area where everything is right next to the road. Um, there will be some tree removal. Um, probably for maybe another half a mile where there just isn't room to put the walls in without true tree removal. But um, we take our trees pretty seriously and um, our goal is to minimize impacts to trees um, out there. I did go and drive both directions uh, uh, when I was out visiting with Sheldon a week ago and I think it's pretty unavoidable at the east end of the South Cove wall um, just because there, there isn't room, but um, it looked like everywhere else we're probably okay with, uh, which is why we're gonna have it on the edge of the freeway, so. Um. Thank you, other questions? Oh, well, thank you very much for joining us and giving us that update, really appreciate okay. it. Look forward to seeing everybody again uh, tomorrow, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, last year I heard about a lot about noise walls and the pinch points, so. Next up, we're gonna go to ID 0235. This is uh, Issaquah Hobart Road Front Street Corridor Study, uh, presented by Faye um, Shafi and John Pascal. Thank you, I'm Sheldon Lynn, again, Public Works Engineering Director. I'm gonna do a short, brief introduction to this and then I'm gonna hand it over to Faye and John to uh, do the presentation. Just wanna uh, let Council know, this is the initial presentation of the complete, completed study uh, that the Council commissioned uh, along with King County about a year and a half ago. Uh, goals of this meeting are that the City Council would have a thorough understanding of the data, the analysis, the results, recommendations of the study, and what, what those mean to the City and to the Council. Uh, also, at the end of the day, so to speak, you know, to get a sense for you know, what projects may resonate with the Council that are in the recommendations. Uh, this project was commissioned by the Council and is in support of the council adopted re a regional agenda for transportation in which the goal number one on that was to improve mobility in and around Issaquah. The study uh, was specifically re referenced alongside as an action item in the regional agenda uh, with other items such as improving the capacity of SR18 and I-90 as well as participating in the Regional Transportation System Initiative Group to develop other regional solutions for traffic uh, affecting the city of Issaquah. The data gathered in this report, you'll see, provides information in support of the, of the city's regional efforts uh, to these ends. While the recommendations very specifically, though, will help improve the citizens' experience along Front Street and the corridor, by improving their safety and making use of the corridor more reliable while keeping the character of Front Street intact. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Faye and John so that they can provide the presentation of the completed study. Great, thank you. Thank you, good evening. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight to present the um, to share with you the results of the study and the findings and recommendations of the study. 
And just to note that um, the study has been completed and we had uh, presented project updates at the uh, couple of CAC meetings, one uh, back in September of last year and uh, one last month. And we had obtained feedback um, on the types of uh, solutions that, um, that were being considered for the corridor. With that being said, I'd just like to let you know we have about 20, a brief 25-minute uh, presentation, and uh, I'll uh, give you an overview of the project and then turn it over to John Pascal from a principal at Transpo Group to present the technical information. And then we have a, a set aside some time for questions and comments at the end. Um, this is a, the Issaquah Hobart Road uh, Front Street Corridor Study is a joint effort by the city and King County. We have partnered together to study the corridor and identify uh, solutions that can help the corridor um, function better and provide more efficient traffic flow. The study is funded by both agencies and is managed by the city. Uh, today's objectives are uh, provide a summary of the study findings and how we got there. Hi um, highlight what the data inventory and uh, traffic modeling has told us about the corridor. And what are the major issues and how solutions were defined for the corridor. Also, we'd like to obtain, as Sheldon mentioned, obtain uh, feedback on the project recommendations. Um, Okay, here we go. So the uh, corridor um, is about 8.2 miles long, and the uh, north limit of the project is at Gilman and Front Street in the city of Issaquah, and the southern limit is at SR18 and uh, Issaquah Hobart Road within the King County, un unincorporated King County. The character of the road changes throughout, and it's rural in the uh, King County area and urban in this, within the city limits, and it carries urban level uh, traffic volumes. So um, the reason this study was initiated was because we needed to gather enough facts and data to help us understand uh, how this corridor is operating currently and, and what are the problem areas along the corridor. Also, the goal was to evaluate and identify solutions that can help enhance safety and travel time uh, reliability along the corridor. It wasn't the intent of the, this uh, project to identify solutions that would uh, increase capacity and traffic volumes. Along the corridor, uh, we are not trying to sell, uh, to fix the congestion problem. We were just trying to identify a smaller projects that can help with safety and um, mobility related issues along the corridor. Also, we wanted to provide a comprehensive inventory of existing corridor um, conditions uh, so that this would provide us with a common baseline. We uh, wanted to also investigate um, future operations speed and safety issues and consider both existing and future needs along the corridor. Um, as uh, this study also provides conceptual design strategies and cost estimates for implementing short-term and long-term improvements and this would provide an action plan on how to move forward. And uh, also to identify the lowest cost and highest value improvements that enhance safety and mobility along the corridor and prioritize these improvements. So now I, can, I will turn, o turn it over to John so he will discuss the uh, technical <laughs> parts of the report and uh, then we have time for questions and answers. Good evening. My name John, is John Pascal again, and uh, with the Transpo Group, and was a project consultant, project manager on this project, but worked closely with both King County staff and, and city staff. 
So one of the, the larger scope items of, of this study effort was uh, basically collecting uh, as much data as we could about the corridor. And this was different types of data sources. It was information about vehicles, uh, traffic volumes, travel speeds. It was information about non-motorized inventory. It was transit information. It was how was the current system operating today, the, the entire corridor and its major intersections. We also collected origin destination information to better understand who was using the corridor, where they were coming from, where they're going. So safety, a uh, big focus of the study effort, and we um, looked at the last five years of, of collision history, which was quite extensive given the eight miles of the corridor. Uh, this is a heat map showing where a um, predominant number of uh, collisions occurred. Uh, we categorized them by severity, uh, whether um, there, were injury, there was injuries, uh, fatalities, Definitely wanted to focus on those a little bit harder to understand if there were things that we could do to address some of those uh, locations. We looked for similar causes or problems and then tried to identify particular improvements that could address those. What we found was generally in the city, uh, at the northern segment of the corridor, there's a higher a number of rear end collisions. That was kind of the predominant type of issue. Um, related to stop and go traffic, a lot of different activity. And then within the county, it was a lot of run off the road uh, collisions or vehicles colliding with, with some other object other than a vehicle. Um, that was a predominant um, finding from that. We also looked at traffic volumes. This is a graph of a particular location just south of Sunset Way. Um, and what we wanted to do is understand just the, the fluctuation of volumes throughout the day and then uh, the directional peaks. Um, we collected this information for a variety of, of different locations along, along the corridor. I'm just sharing you with one, one of these. Uh, you'll see that, um, you know, as, as everyone who drives it knows, um, heavy northbound peak in the AM, uh, and you see that uh, there. And then in the, in the PM, uh, you know, heavy southbound peak, but it kind of starts at three and it continues through six. Um, doesn't, there's kind of two peaks, one at the school time, one, one there at the commuting um, hour going in the southbound direction. The county, it's, it's, a, it's similar um, findings, except you know, a little bit more predominant southbound peak. And then we also, uh, you know, there's two peaks in the AM, one really coinciding with schools and that uh, before the corridor becomes congested at the north end, we're actually able to, to actually um, serve more vehicles um, earlier in the morning than as it gets congested at the north end with the schools and everything, it actually kind of, um, uh, the volumes drop and then they go back up uh, towards about eight o'clock. Uh, this, this section just south of Second Avenue um, in towards Cedar Grove, Ro Cedar Grove Ro Road, excuse me, uh, serves the highest amount of vehicles on a daily basis, uh, just over 20,000 vehicles a day. Um, that's, we just don't see many uh, two-lane roadways that, that, that serve that, you know, much more than that. Um, uh, they're, they're few and far between. South of Cedar Grove R Road is um, range from about 11,000 to 15,000. I have a question about this. So the previous data was taken on Front Street just south of Sunset Way and showed a morning peak of about 500 and an afternoon twin peaks of about 325. Then um, this data, which is north of May Valley Road, shows peaks of uh, those twin peaks of over a thousand and the PM peak of close to a thousand. If we had taken the data that was just south of Sunset, if that was taken just south of Newport, would that have shown, is the north end actually less traffic than the middle or the south end? And, and if so, that's surprising. I sort of assumed that the further north you went, the more traffic you would get. Well, um if, if you see traffic congestion, yes, maybe that, that's true, but it's in terms of number of vehicles, uh, the, the south end is serving more vehicles uh, than the north end because you have more intersections, driveways, pedestrian activity, other things that are contributing to and lowering the, essentially the capacity or throughput of the corridor. And also some of the vehicles are, you know, turning off to second and Newport Way and so forth, so. Um, I, think, I think what you see here is generally some of those peaks are capacity, you're reaching capacity down in Front Street, um, 
capacities, marker sections, and the other activity going on. Thank you. Travel speeds, we collected travel speeds, uh, actually went out there and, and drove the corridor many different days um, to get a, because the speeds vary by time and by day, by weather, by other incidents uh, in the area. And this is just another heat map of those, those speeds. Uh, the, the left map is the AM um, northbound, so uh, you know, slow speeds within the downtown and then also around May Valley and Cedar Grove Road. Um, and then the, the right map is, is the southbound, um, again in the downtown, and then as you get essentially past like Poo Poo Point and, and May Valley Road, it kind of frees up going southbound. This, all this information that we collected uh, was information that, um, you know, we basically heard a lot from all the stakeholders and, and people that we talked with through this effort. The other unique thing that we did with the quarter study is we collected origin destination information. And so we did that by essentially uh, putting up Wi-Fi readers at various points along the corridor um, so that we could essentially collect a kind of a hit on a, um, on a unique signal from a, a mobile device or um, anything that emitted Wi-Fi. And then if we got that hit somewhere else on the corridor, we, we were able to understand how long it took that device to get there and then where they were going generally. And so we summarize this. This is one of many maps in the report that shows different uh, distributions uh, throughout the, the, the corridor. Um, I think the interesting thing is, is it confirmed some of some initial suspicions, but we didn't really have any data to support it. But um, if, let's see, let's look at the, um, the map on the left again. So basically, if you're starting just south of Highway 18, where does that traffic go? All the vehicles that, that basically start south of 18 and are going north, um, basically about 50% of them go all the way through the, the, the corridor and either turn on the Gilman, turn on the I-90, or go north on East Lake Sammamish Parkway. It's about 50% through. Um, in the PM going southbound, generally, um, and if you start essentially near I-90, and track those vehicles going through the system. About 50% of them reach, either get on Highway 18 or go south beyond 18. So it's, it's a general a split, 50% 50, 50 through traffic along the, the corridors is um, what we found. Question? Well, Council Member Winterstein. Thank you. You just said uh, the, on the northbound AM trips, so you picked up vehicles at highway 18 what if they entered from cedar grove or from a valley road or or and, and those are the primary arteries we know that that but did you not then track where they went yes only those that started at 18. yeah so we, we tracked those as well and those those that would be a separate essentially data set because it's a different origin yeah this so, is your 18 origin right yeah i'm just showing you two of i think 10 different ones okay. we, we did okay. yeah so okay. like cedar grove may valley and then the same thing on the north end we tracked um from sunset way inter interchange from newport way so going southbound so we wanted to make sure we got the predominant flows council member ray just a um quick clarification so you were saying that about on the in the morning, the northbound, about 50% was passed through. Um, so if I look at the four bubbles on top, it looks like about 75%. Um, make it all the way to the top of the chart. Am I missing something or is there, that just looks like more than 50%. Um, no, I mean, so the 17% like on Newport, we don't know for, I mean, we could assume that those are going pass through or we could assume that they're going somewhere in Issaquah. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's hard to say where those trips are actually ending. Um, so perhaps 50 to 75 percent would be a better term. Great. Thank you. I mean, these, these numbers total up to 100 percent in both. So I'm Hopefully. assuming that what that means is you can then just subtract out May Valley, Cedar, and Tiger, and, you know, you're left with 84 percent make the, uh, that, get, that get on south of 18, extend all the way to at least Newport. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or second, maybe. Right. I, um, I, oh, I'm i sorry, Council, Council Member Goodman, did you have your hand up? Nope. Uh, 
So do we have numbers of who gets on south of 18 heading north in the morning versus who gets on at May Valley Cedar and, and Tiger Mountain Miramont? Mm -hmm. How do they compare? We do. I don't, I don't have that information offhand. I'd have to open up the report and look at it. Um, but it's, um, all these figures are within the, the, the study report itself. We did separate out. We wanted to understand, particularly at the south end, who was getting off of 18 and going on the corridor as opposed to who was coming up from a, the Landsberg um, Road. So we, we, we separated those movements out. Uh, but I, I can't recite them offhand. I'd be happy, I could pull up those, those maps if you're interested, um, happy to do the, that. The reason that I'm interested is it's really interesting that the previous map on travel speeds shows such a high northbound peak uh, around Miramont, um, given if, if the vast majority of the traffic is getting on at 18 and going all the way through, if 84% of the traffic is going all the way through, through it's really interesting there's a particular slowdown in well, that area so and speaks to the potential of, you know, mitigations and traffic activities in the middle of the road to have a pronounced effect on the experience of people traveling from south of 18 all the way up to Issaquah. I think what you, what you have to remember is that this is, um, that there's also traffic getting on the corridor, you know, at Tiger Mountain and other, other sections of the corridor. Well, so, that's, what, that's yeah, why I was yeah, speaking to yeah. what fraction of, of the traffic in that corridor is coming all the way from the, the south end. And I see, I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah, well, we, I don't know that offhand, but yeah, that's something that could, that could be figured out. The AM is 23%. If you could go to the, I'm sorry, if you go to the microphone. Yeah. For the AM peak is 23% uh, coming from south of Highway 18. Oh, and the other 77% is traffic and then that gets on. Coming, and then we have some coming from Cedar Grove Road, 25% oh, yeah. oh, added to that. And then 12% from May Valley Road added to that until oh, they right. come up. Okay, so a non-trivial yes. fraction is traffic that gets on in the middle of the yes. road. Yeah. That would ex help yeah. explain why there's such a such a slowdown in the yeah. middle, and and, and it says that that's an organic response to be, there being more people getting on in that stretch. Okay, thank you. It's extremely helpful. Okay, moving along here. Um, so future conditions, we not just looked at uh, how the quarter's operating today, we're, how people are using it today, we also looked at into the future. And so maybe spend a little bit of time on this slide and talk about that. Um, one, we know that this quarter is part of a regional system. It's one of four major north-south corridors that are serving kind of southeast King County. Um, Highway 18, Esquah Hobart, 900, 405, all those corridors are congested today. They'll continue to be congested in the future. Um, but we wanted to understand how things change over time, given the, the, land, the adopted land use plans in the region. And so we had to utilize some tools. We utilized a, a several different tools in, in order to come up with the forecasts. One, we, we utilized the PSRC, Puget Sound Regional Council travel demand model based upon a 2040 uh, horizon year. Um, that's the adopted regional plan. Uh, we also looked at the Issaquah city model uh, which is kind of smaller in focus. It doesn't include all the areas south of, 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 the, of the city, Maple Valley, Black Diamond, some of those areas where we're seeing growth um, now and in the future. And then we, um, from those two, we actually built an operational model for the corridor. So a detailed model that uh, simulated that how each of the intersections worked under different kind of timing schemes, under different improvement scenarios, very detailed stuff so we could actually model and calibrate to the queues that we were seeing, the vehicle queue lengths that we're seeing today, the level of service, the travel times that we we're measuring. So we had a model that basically was calibrated to what we found today. And then we incorporated the forecast information from these bigger regional models and then modeled that uh, to, to really understand what the future looked like for the corridor. We made, we had, there was assumptions in the PSRC model about you know, the major projects that are in the adopted plan, such as widening Highway 18, um, the funded improvements in Sound Transit 3, um, 
and also the widening of 405 south of Bellevue. Those were all things that were assumed in the forecasts because those are things that are in the adopted regional plan. We did not want to stray from what was adopted. We wanted to really focus on what the region had, had already adopted and use that as a baseline. That doesn't mean that other scenarios couldn't be evaluated, but that's what we, that's what we used in this, in this evaluation. So this is just a, a general um, uh, illustration of that, but there's detailed forecasts in, in, the, in the corridor, I mean, in the uh, corridor report. Uh, PM peak hour, AM peak hour um, information and how those volumes change, and I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that here in a second. Question? Yeah. Council Member The, um, oh, oh, yep. SR18 widening, I, uh, just to be clear, that's um, the, what's funded, that's the interchange improvement at I-90 and uh, four lanes south and to Raging River, and that's it. So in the 2040 regional plan, it's the widening, um, it's, it's widening of SR18 all the way. The four additional lanes. six miles yeah. um, from Raging River to where it's four yeah. lanes. At yeah, so the regional plan isn't just funded improvements. It's also improvements that are, that are thought to be okay. funded. You Thank know, you for down clarifying that. When you were saying yeah. that earlier, um, you talked about the projects that were, I thought you were saying that, you know, are, um, we know are going to happen, but that is one that's, on the wish list, that second later phase of the widening, but yeah. that's not funded. Yeah. Okay, so this includes, so your analysis includes 18 is four lanes from Hobart all the way to 90. Yep. Thank you. I like that you have in the future Redmond as a next Sammamish. <laughs> All right, you can yeah. keep going. That was actually, someone pointed that out last time and I, I I forgot to update that. <laughs> so what, is, what do the forecasts mean? Well, we wanted to put them into terms that people understood, right? And that's, it's really about travel time or speeds. Um, and so that's what these graphs are, uh, these figures are intended to, to highlight. So the left is the AM peak hour, on the right is the PM peak hour. And so, I mean, I'm sorry, this is all AM peak hour. The next slide is PM peak hour. On the left is existing and on the right is the future 2040. So the existing is based upon what we collected today. So that's actual information that's summarized by corridor segment. And you see each of the segments. Uh, they're pretty much between major intersections. Um, and then the future is based upon all the modeling and the forecasting that we did. Um, and so in the, in the AM, um, we uh, generally, you see a greater decline in some of the off-peak off direction um, because that's, that's where there's a greater chance of, you know, essentially um, fitting more vehicles on the corridor because we're, we're at capacity essentially going northbound. Um, you'd also see in the, in, the, in the future that the rolling queue is extended up on the north, on the county segment at the south, so that just gets um, uh, worse in the future. Um, also, the downtown area as well just has more um, urban development and um, congestion occurs in downtown. There's just a lot more friction. So that's what's contributing to some of the lower speeds for downtown. Council Member Winterstein. In the 2040 AM peak uh, northbound, uh, so this is, so I appreciate uh, speed. We understand that. Is that also because of the lower average speeds through those various segments compared to northbound today. Um, do you have, <clears throat> did you forecast the volumes as well? We did, yes. Okay, it would be good to see that kind of lined up next to that. If that's, if you could look that up and somehow get that to, you know, um, or just get a percentage, or, or yeah, what we, kind of change? We have the percentages. Because you had the, or is sure. that in, so that's not in the data we already saw. I can see existing volumes in earlier slides, but not the 2040 model. Yeah, so there's a table um, 14 in the corridor study report that summarizes the AM peak hour uh, changes in, 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 tr in uh, volumes. And so what we found, like, um, you know, it averaged between uh, about 1% to 2% a year uh, growth in, in actual traffic volumes mm -hmm. um, in, in, in each direction. 
well, actually in the, in the northbound, it was between 0.8% a year to about 1.5% a year going northbound because you just physically, it's very difficult. From two, 2017 through 2040, so it's just, just a year. You know, so 1% a year, so a year keeps, yeah, okay. so that, that equates to 30%, 40% increase overall. Okay. And then this is the, the PM, uh, same figure. So, so southbound is, is the, the peak direction uh, here. And what we're finding is that the congestion becomes more severe um, in the, in the downtown Front Street segment of the corridor. That actually becomes essentially a, a bottleneck at second, um, which actually meters traffic and the speeds, at least in the modeling, uh, show to increase by one or two miles per hour south of that. And that's just because everything is funneling into the system at the north end and that's, and that's metering it. And, and so I like to equate that as that's probably within plus or minus the confidence interval of the modeling. Um, so while there is a change, as I would, I would consider a, a no change from today, essentially, going southbound. Um, and then in northbound, you see that those volume, uh, the speeds actually drop there, particularly north of Sunset to um, I-90. Councilmember Winterstein. Similar volume growth. Again, and again, this is just the projects that you know about. This is not in your model in 2040. There's no improvements along this corridor. This is just the regional right. projects, right? Yeah, it's just the. So if I if I would just, I guess I don't have that in front of me, but I'm going to guess you're going to tell me it's going to be between within the within the. Um, allowable error in the model. Yeah, so table 13 um, in, the, in the report, mm -hmm. it's very similar growth rates to the AM, um, you know, averaging between a half a percent a year to one and a half percent a year, depending upon the segment. All right, I will kind of speed through some of this stuff here. So ultimately, so what did all this analysis, what did we find? Um, what, how could we summarize it into some, some, some talking points, some bullets? Um, here are the kind of the major themes. From a safety standpoint, that's on the left side, you know, high rate of rear end collisions, left turn collisions, particularly at the north end of the corridor, high rate of runoff crashes at the southern end, a lot of turning conflicts, driveways, side streets, particularly on the county segment with a lot of the, the smaller uh, roadways. Um, and then also the parking and some of the, the, the pedestrian crossings and things created some additional um, uh, safety concerns along Front Street. Uh, mobi Mobility-wise, you know, the heavy AM peak going northbound, particularly around Cedar Grove, May Valley. Uh, the cut through traffic on Tiger Mountain Road, we heard that, you know, when those right turn restrictions were implemented at first, you know, did see a lot of, a number of folks obeying that now not the the compliance is not as, as good um, and so you still see that cut through traffic uh, heavy pm congestion along the northern segment and then you still the, the rolling queue um, whether it's in the am going northbound or in the, the pm going southbound we interviewed stakeholders uh, we had a stakeholder committee come together uh, met um, talked about you know the goals and and what they were facing along the corridor. This ranged from agencies to the Miramont Community Association to uh, East Side Fire and Rescue to the school district was a major player in this. Um, they really confirmed a lot of the things that we already knew and what we'd already been hearing from the agency staff and county in, in the city, but worsening peak, peak period congestion. Um, you know, the small changes, day-to-day -day changes or incidents really have this enormous ripple effect, not just on this quarter, but every other major quarter around here. Um, and that this was causing real impacts to economic development, to the businesses, to the service providers that, that depend upon this corridor, whether it's, you know, the garbage um, folks um, or the King County Solid Waste, um, all those type of providers, the post office. Solutions, what, what we heard uh, from, from everyone was 
safety, focus on safety improvements, look at intersection treatments, look at localized improvements. Um, think about what transit um, solutions there could be or incentives to, to get people to carpool or into other modes and hey, make um, real-time information more prevalent so people have a choice and can alter their route. One of the things that we wanted to do before we got to solutions, because it's easy when you start a study effort to quickly just go right to a solution. Um, this is the project that we need. We wanted to avoid that. We wanted to be, avoid being trapped into a particular project. So we put every solution we could think of onto the table. And you actually see that in the report. We have a solution table. It's about three pages long. And it's every type of solution that you could think of for a ped pedestrian treatment, a bicycle treatment, a transit solution, um, a technology solution, a signal improvement, an intersection improvement, a corridor treatment, um, school bus pullouts, uh, access management. Um, it's a long, long list. This is just a few of, of of, of, of the different solutions that we considered. And then once we identified the problems or the problem locations, we tried to look at if there was a solution that addressed that problem. We wanted to make sure that we were looking at everything. And that was one of the ma major themes and feedback items that we wanted to get from the, from the council committee back in September was, hey, is, is this the right solution uh, table or matrix of different types of solutions? With that, uh, we developed evaluation criteria because once the projects were defined, we wanted to make sure we were evaluating them appropriately from a safety perspective, from a reliability, and from an implementation. So we had these different criteria here, safety criteria, and, and um, each one of these, and, and you'll see in the project list in the appendix of the report, we actually rated each project, kind of like a consumer reports uh, style. Uh, to better understand which project kind of bubbled up to the top and which ones maybe didn't address some of these as, as best. And then the process. Um, and this is what you'll see in the report in the different chapters, but the existing conditions, how is the corridor performing? How does it change in the future? What are the gaps? What are the solutions that we should be considering? And then what are the recommended projects? And then what are their priorities? And when are they needed? And how much do they cost? Uh, which ones provide the most benefit? Um, we developed a long list of projects, and that's in the, in the report as well. And we separated them into three tiers. One, the recommended projects, which I'll share in just a minute. The lower priority projects, which the council can, can consider. Um, and then projects that we, we ultimately didn't recommend moving forward. So I was gonna just, I think this is just about it, but I'm gonna wrap up by going through some of the project recommendations. I'm gonna start with the city projects, and you know, if you have questions about the project, you know, feel free to interrupt. Um, the first one was at Sunset Way, adding the left turn lanes going eastbound and westbound. That frees up a little bit of, uh, provides a little bit of additional capacity. It also provides for protected left turn movements so that um, left turns aren't conflicting with, with pedestrian movements. Um, the next one is a non-motorized improvement at 2nd Avenue, basically building bike lane and um, a, a, a complete sidewalk connecting to the trail from the 2nd Avenue intersection on the south side or southeast side of the intersection and going up 2nd Avenue to the trail crossing. Uh, access management tre treatments essentially from Sunset uh, to uh, Holly. Um, and this is really to kind of improve safety along the corridor is the primary reason for that, both vehicle safety, but also pedestrian bicycle safety because you have these left turn movements, people coming in and out of Alder and, and Holly, and you know drivers are impatient at times because of the congestion and so they're not always paying attention to the, the pedestrians walking along the, the sidewalk. Um, then we have dogwood. This really complements that access management treatment. So um, if we're restricting access at a couple locations, we wanna improve access at a location. And so dogwood would be a, a, a location where we could improve access from the side street um, and also improve pedestrian crossing there. And then adaptive signal, signal control. And this is really um, about improved reliability, being able to respond to changing conditions. And so the essentially smarter signals that are demand-based that are 
constantly looking at the, the volumes out there and changing the signal timing uh, to respond to that. That would not just be along the corridor, but that would be Newport, Sunset, Second. And then digital travel time signs, at C2 at the bottom. I, we didn't map that, but those would be at uh, key locations, Highway 18, I-90, uh, 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 Newport Way, SR 900. And then projects along Issaquah Hobart Road. And so um, May Valley intersection, uh, we looked at both roundabout and signal, but basically adding um, uh, additional northbound through lane um, on the side to kind of get that northbound traffic flowing a little bit better in the, in the AM. Um, and the round, we looked at both the roundabout and signal, so we costed out the roundabout, um, but both provided some level of improvement um, in operations and safety. We also looked at, because of the, the truck restrictions uh, into Issaquah, we're seeing some changes on how trucks are uh, using May Valley Road, and so that's causing some issues with the, both the intersection operations there, but also just the, the amount of trucks and the turning movements both on and off May Valley Road. So we have an intersection treatment there about lengthening the left turn lanes, the right turn lane on, on May Valley Road. That could be a, an interim improvement if the other improvements are you know, longer down the, the road. Mm -hmm. And then Cedar Grove uh, intersection, very similar to May Valley, uh, looked at both roundabout and uh, a signal uh, option. Um, basically adding, again, um, additional through lanes through the intersection that would taper back into um, the, the two-lane corridor. So basically, because that's kind of a noose in the system, it would open it up, free it up, so to speak, and allow for a little bit better movements. Um, I would say that the reason we kept the, those open was because additional design evaluation needs to happen, and so if, the, if King County was to move forward with one or both of those, they would be looking and trying to really finalize the design. And the feasibility is really about environmental impacts, about property, right-of-way needs, uh, costs, and so forth. So what does this all mean? This was, the, these are intersection level service, uh, looking at three scenarios, is existing 2017. Future baseline is what the, the forecasts were based on, upon, with no improvements to the corridor and then the future 2040 with the recommended projects. And so what you see is, is the level of service um, under those, those three scenarios. What you'll notice is there are only five intersections that actually have all three. So the, there's, of, the, of these inter study intersections, only five are in the recommended um, projects. So there's, there's five of them that actually have three different level of service circles. Dogwood, Alder, Sunset, um, May Valley and Cedar Grove Road. And so what we found was um, in the AM that the projects would improve operations to LOSD or better. So I'm sorry, <clears throat> does that mean that the intersections uh, where there's only two numbers or two letters, uh, because there are, there's not improvements going on there, there isn't, an, there isn't anticipated traffic improvement? So is that, is that how I read that? Yeah, so uh, from an operational uh, standpoint, there wouldn't be much of an improvement over what is in baseline. So what you see there for like, let's take a, an example here. Uh, let's look at uh, oh Newport Way, which is right, right here, I believe. Did I get that right? Yeah. Yep. C, C today, C in the future. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how that works. Uh, same with, I think this is second avenue here, B and then D in the future. So. Okay, and so southbound AM gets worse, um, goes from north of May Valley Road, it goes from D to F and uh, south of there, it goes from F to F. Well, it's at today and it stays it up in the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So I thought that the AM peak was bad northbound and not so bad southbound and vice versa for the PM peak. So this is just the AM. Right. Right. I thought southbound wasn't a particular problem in the AM. If I look at, a, if I look at the charts that you gave me 
if I, if I look at the future conditions AM peak, it all looked pretty good southbound. Yeah, so this isn't, this isn't a directional. This is, this, is, this is the intersection as a whole. So let's say May Valley today, it operates at E and the baseline e, e, but with the improvement, it would operate in B. So that would be oh. both northbound and, and southbound. Oh, so I can't really tease out the, the direction. This is weird, right? Because these in this one is direction, overall these intersection are great, operations. And in the other direction, it's horrible, usually. Yeah. Yeah, so this is overall intersection. That's why we're giving you a lot of different information. We're giving you the travel time for the corridor so you can see the directionality. We're giving you the intersection overall. And then in the appendix, we actually have by approach, but that was just too much information to try to summarize here in, in a graphic. But what we don't have is future conditions. We don't have a visual in both directions of future conditions with improvements, right? Oh, so you've got, it, right. You've got future conditions AM and PM, but that's assuming we don't do anything, right? And then here you've got intersections, assuming we do something. Right. But what this doesn't really tell me is the, the real problem, of, co of course, is uh, northbound in the morning and southbound in the afternoon. And this doesn't really tell me the extent to which those particular problems uh, are impacted by the proposed solutions. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it's safe to say that, I mean, that's a good question, and I thought about that, that, that point, too. I think it's safe to say that the, the slides that I showed you earlier for the baseline, you know, those travel times are not going to change much be, with these localized improvements, these improvements. Um, are, are not just meant to help peak hour as much as they can. It's really also the off-peak times or the fringe times where these improvements are going to also provide some benefit. So, but that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good point. Council Member Ray. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. So if I look at Dogwood, uh, we're a D today. Uh, without mitigation, we're an F. And with mitigation, we're an A, which is, I think, pretty cool. We go to, from an F to an A. So, and then if I scroll back up, to what we do in Dogwood, it says Dogwood Street intersection improvement. What's the nature of those improvements? Because that's pretty cool if you can go from an F to an A. So that's a location where I think we're not um, particularly defined on what those will be, except that it would be a signal that would control and we, we would, and this is still open for discussion um, if this project moves forward, but try to realign both legs of dogwood um, into a single so that they're both aligned right across from one another and put in a signal that would control a side street access. And so that's why it goes from an F to, uh, to an A is because the F is really, the cars can't get out during the peak times or, or turn left. It's just yeah. all congested? Yeah. yeah. And just one other quick question for you. So on C1, which is adaptive signal control, would that just be at the single intersection or would we look to have more, a kind of a network of adaptive signal controls? Yeah, I can pull that up real quick. I can show you what, what I mean by that. So I have this, um, these project cut sheets that are in the back of the, of the um, corridor report. Let me circle to the adaptive. There it is. So this is a, a C1. Um, you'll see the intersections, and that would be part of the adaptive system. So there's essentially eight of them, um, four, along, four along Front Street, and then Second, and then Newport Way. Thank you. Councilmember Winterstein. Yeah, I'm going to go back to Dogwood AM. If you could go back to your slide, this is AM peak hour intersection LOS. Okay, and so as uh, Councilmember Bray just pointed out, um, F to A, and that um, I don't want to get bogged down too much on this intersection, but I know when you're scoring intersections, it's the average of all wait times, all movements through yeah. there. And for it to be F is amazing because right now it's really only traffic off, trying to get off of, uh, 
uh, dogwood that's most delayed. Because currently, northbound, there's left-hand turn lane, so people can still flow by. Um, and so for it to be an F, that's saying even Front Street traffic, north and south, uh, um, in that calculation of F, uh, you're, you're counting for that. And then when you improve the turning movements for dogwood, the whole thing goes to A. So I, I, that, seem, that just doesn't make sense to me so, uh, in that one. So the way that we measure intersection level service is when it's not, when all approaches are not controlled. And just, so basically today you have the side street approaches that are stop sign controlled. Mm -hmm. So so what you, that F is measuring that side street. It's just, not taking into, because because the, the, the volumes okay. along or the vehicles along front street, they don't stop, Okay. The, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. And then the A is measuring what? And then the A is measuring all four now, all, all four approaches. So okay, northbound, so that, southbound, okay. eastbound, westbound. Right. Um, and okay, so when as we look at this, we, ha we, we should think about whether or not there are controls there or not. If they're not, it's just the, in this case, just dogwood. And, and when there is a control, it's all four yeah. lakes. Okay. This is the same graphic of the PM. I apologize it doesn't show very well on here, um, but um, this graphic is also in, in the corridor study report. But in this case, again, it's the five intersections, uh, the projects, the same projects in the PM, they improve four of the five to LOSD or better. And the one, prod, the one location that even with the project, it still operates at F is, is Sunset. Wait, don't, don't, Sorry. don't move away so quickly. When you described the project about Sunset earlier, could you just, could you re, uh, just revisit that? You talked about uh, on Front Street, there being dedicated east and west turn. Yeah. Let me just pull that up here. Pockets, lanes on Front Street, both directions. Yeah, so basically we'd narrow down the lanes as much as we could. So you see um, that uh, basically put, this would be just a through lane. Mm -hmm. Today it's a through left, I believe. This is a right turn pocket today. Then we create a left. And then same thing on the, on the other side. I uh, would create a left and then this would be a through right. Um, we'd have to move back the curbing here on the, along the southwest corner. Um, same thing with here. So we'd basically be re rebuilding the, the sidewalk and the curbing here along the south side, and then we'd be narrowing up the lanes to about 10 feet wide um, on both sides. Um, and then we'd be removing parking from essentially here to there. And that's about seven so spaces. So in today, um, uh, that's a big red F of an intersection. Um, your model says we don't improve the performance of that at all. It stays F. Yeah, it stays F in the PM peak hour, um, but then during those, during the AM it improves. I did it, it improves. Let's go back. Up to D. Yeah, okay. so in the AM it, it goes from uh, E to, uh, sorry, C, uh, from F, F to, to D. D, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I just, that's, that's not a lot of, from F to F, to, staying, I'm, I'm thinking in the PM, but um, staying at F, that just gets, red gets my attention, so. I it's just not just that. the level of service F, because uh, your level of services F is 80 seconds or more delay. Uh, so level of service F could mean 85 seconds, or it could mean 500 seconds. Yeah, so it's gonna get worse, so you're gonna have more delay for the future, but then when you have the improvement, the delay still is, the level of service is F, but your delay is going to be reduced. So maybe you have, three, at, maybe you have the actual delay times yes, in your table. So that, that's fine, we don't, get, we don't have to get into these. What, the, the, at Poop northbound, excuse me, PM peak, hit, um, What's the intersection? What are you measuring at Poo Poo Point Lot? You just that. So, so we're just talking that, about that's getting that's getting in and out of Poo Poo Point. It's the side street, yeah, and the entrance to the to the parking lot. 
And, and so above that, uh, there's the CC. You can barely see it up there. I have a copy in front of me. It's a little easier to see. I think that's the intersection of Front Street and 2nd Avenue. Correct. This one right here? Yes. So we're saying today that average is C. And with all these improvements, C. Um, and that today, poo poo point, which is just getting, which is just measuring getting in and out of that parking lot. That's all that that's measuring, right? Uh, is B today go to C? So um, I'll I'll just, you know, to me the most interesting slide in this whole presentation, and I apologize, I'm not going to make you go back to it, but is the one that measures the current, uh, not the collision history, uh, but the um, the average speeds. Uh, particularly in the PM uh, and particularly southbound because if there's a big red bubble uh, through town all the way down to 2nd Street, um, my sense just through observing things has been because you've got, you've got Front Street, you may have such traffic from 2nd Avenue, you certainly have Newport Way, all, how many lanes is that? Coming down to one lane southbound uh, by 2nd Street. Uh, so we've got a lot, nobody's exiting, everybody's coming on, and, and, it's, and, it, and south of there, it's slow, 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 because, just because it is, for whatever, mm -hmm. and you show a red point down there, it's kind of orange, it's less than 20 miles an hour average in the PM, all the way down to Poo Poo Point, where it's now less than five miles per hour, and then it stays below 20 until you get to May Valley Road. My perception has always been that the backups that we experience in the PM on Front Street are because, um, the prim and, and those other roads that I mentioned, are primarily because something is happening south of town. And I think you made reference to that as well. And what's interesting, if you watch it closely, um, it's not every day. Sometimes things, especially on Newport Way in particular, which is the one I see most often, Things just seem to flow through, uh, and then there'll be, it'll be a day or 10 days in a row, it gets pretty random, where that'll be, no, that'll be stop and go because of that backup from Hobart Road onto Front Street, past Second Avenue, all the way up to where Newport Way comes in to Front Street. Um, so that, which happens regularly, uh, it would seem to me that the, if, um, when it, uh, if you want to make a difference for more people, uh, is is how do we how do we through improvements um, minimize the number of times that that backup happens uh, in the PM and and I and I think I'm seeing I don't think I'm seeing anything in this based upon your intersection measurements uh, performance that says that. Um, <coughs> there will be any better performance uh, through this package of projects. 2040, all projects, southbound PM. Yeah. So I think, I think there, we're saying two different things. One, we're saying that if you're looking at overall corridor uh, progression along the entire corridor, we're not painting a, a great picture here. Um, and we're saying that that's not going to change drastically over time. Um, perhaps even get worse. But what we are saying is that we, we developed a set of recommended projects that are localized in nature that provide for some safety enhancements and also some benefits that possibly aren't gonna be felt during the peak of the peak, but will improve operations um, during those, those fringe hours. Um, and that's, that's as best as that we're going to get with, with these. Okay, thank you for that summary. Yeah. All right, okay, I think I just had one more slide here. And then, uh, well, actually, I think it was, I think Sheldon was gonna be up. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, next steps. Uh, recommendations in the report will be proposed as part of the major update of the city's capital improvement plan uh, that's scheduled to be updated in 2019 for the years 2020 to 2025. Uh, 
However, the process for the 2019 update actually will begin with some public engagement this year in 2018 uh, to seek input from the community on the projects, not just the projects from this study, but projects from uh, the rest of the CIP as well. And then, you know, prioritization and things of that sort will also be part of that engagement. Uh, while the methods of engagement haven't yet been determined, uh, some ideas may include online surveys, open houses, uh, but the administration is still trying uh, to work up a plan here for what that public engagement will look like in the latter part of 2018. So those are the next steps. Uh, and so I guess if there's other questions. We, Count, we Council Member Goodman. Thank you. Um, <coughs> King County, is the King County Council receiving this, this information as well? And is the understanding that they are also going to, <coughs> that body is also going to consider including these projects on it? We, uh, act we, act yeah. we actually have Eileen McManus from King County Roads here, so I'll let her answer the question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eileen McManus with King County, as you heard. Um, our council has not, we haven't presented yet to them, but they are well aware of it. They've been updated. They, we're presenting to them uh, the beginning of May, or actually it'll be at their council meeting at the end of May. Um, we are, you know, these projects were, are going to be in our transportation needs report, and then it's a matter of finding funding. So it's can we, you know, will we get grants? Will we be able to, you know, work with the city and, and come up with some joint projects and, and get those in the books? But we do first have to go ahead and study these two intersections to get a better feel for what's the best, the best um, design for that, those intersections. Thank you. Any more questions? Council Member Hunt. A question I think for Mr. Pascal. Um, uh, on both Front Street and Issaquah Hobart Road, there was the recommendation for the digital travel sign, travel time signs, and I'm wondering what, if any, effect on speed or intersection improvement or what, what in the models the benefit of those signs is. Sure. Why don't I just... That, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, just so for those following along, at, possibly at home, let me just pull that up so people understand what we mean by that. So what we're talking about is, is basically uh, travel time signs placed strategically you know, within the, the study area. And we actually kind of noted some of some possible locations um, even I-90, SR-18, and then the two interchanges in Issaquah, and over at uh, SR-900 May Valley. Um, so that's a very difficult thing to model. Um, I think what the intent of that would be that we know that the system, not just Issaquah Hobart Road, is under intense strain and that any incident is going to make things fluctuate and uh, quite drastically, so we want to provide real-time information so people can make choices. I know that they have that information available on their, their phones and perhaps you know some of their cars real-time, but we want to make it front and center so that they're making a, you know, educated, um, informed choices on, on how to get from point A to point B. Okay. Would you characterize it then as a safety? It's, it's improving the safety, but not necessarily the mobility through the area? I would say it's improving mobility. I, I, if that, if I, because I see that sign, decide to go a different direction, say five minutes off of my commute, uh, you know, that would, that'd be a benefit. I look at this and realize I'm in the wrong business. $2.2 million for six signs. I, I, somebody that's, I realize public works projects have costs associated with them that are very different than well we doubled it because sector. we're putting them in washed out right away and that just makes projects very very expensive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I would explain um so can we go back to the future conditions pm peak hour for a second so when this this is sort of for sheldon and for emily when this comes back and we start talking about capital improvement uh, sorry, the, the one that's got the, its speeds. The corridor? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. 
So, um, do you have this? Do you have this data with the proposed improvements? Is this out there somewhere? This this data. This is without yeah. improvements. We we did we did um, evaluate it with improvements, but it it the confidence interval of it just wasn't that that much different from what you see under this uh, 2040. So it just. Really, because your your a lot of your inter a lot of your intersections got a lot better, but you're saying the this, this a lot data of it was, look was like the si so this is just looking at north south travel you know yeah. much of the intersection improvements were also about kind of east west and side street access to the corridor, so um, okay. I, I you know perhaps there is but you have to remember it's averaged over you know a fairly in some cases other than Newport and Sunset you know they're fairly long segments. So. Well, I guess what I was hoping for, if that data exists, two things. First is, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, adding times would be helpful, right? So if you go from Gilman to Sunset, that's a half mile. So one mile per hour, that'd be a half hour. And then if you go from Sunset to Newport, that's two tenths of a mile. So one mile per hour, that'd be 12 minutes. So you start adding up and you say, okay, it takes me a half hour to get to Sunset and it takes me 42 minutes to get to Newport and so on and so forth and you integrate down the, down the line. Yeah. And you get some idea of how long it might take to travel that corridor in 2040. Now, if you then say, what do these numbers look like with the improvements, um, that is, I think, information that would help me understand the potential impacts of these improvements uh, and I realize I, I take your point to the side streets and the safety side of things that doesn't reflect those, but it would give me some idea of uh, what these impacts would be on the actual experience of running this road from north to south or south to north. Okay. Other questions? Councilmember Ray. So I'm going to just go into the hypothetical sphere, sphere for a minute because nothing I've really heard tonight looks like an investment really makes a, that the city can make, makes a big difference to this congestion on Front Street. And part of it is the um, economic impact of the congestion on Front Street. So let's say, just hypothetically, the money was not an issue. What could the city do to really move the needle on getting traffic through town? Yeah, you know, <laughs> those hypothetical questions are difficult. I know. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we, I would say that we did look at, at uh, capacity improvements along the corridor um, in the, in the, during the study. And you'll see a few of those things in the project list. You'll see that we considered a northbound, essentially, um, time of day kind of use, widening the shoulder and, and allowing vehicles to, to use it during certain peak times. Um, what we found is once they hit second, it was all jammed up again. Um, so it really becomes an Issaquah issue of what you want to do in your downtown, what you want your downtown to be and feel like. And so I think the answer, I think you can probably answer the question perhaps better on your own than, than I can, but um, you could improve throughput through downtown, but it's going to come at a severe impact. Thanks. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sheldon, do you have anything else to present on this? So one thing I want to do, and I didn't do it for the previous item, um, the I-90 auxiliary lane, is, and um, council is gonna see this um, in, a, in a draft from the, from the mayor and I, but I, I would like to start taking public comment at committee of the whole council meetings. We haven't historically done it because again, we're not taking action in these meetings, but I think um, these are topics that um, if I read the audience right, there's folks in the audience that have thoughts on this topic. And um, so what I'd like to do is anybody who wants to give us three minutes uh, of their mind, they're welcome to come up to the podium, give us your name, and if you would like your relationship to the city. Start there. Thank you, my name is Dawn Perkins. Um, new to Issaquah, we moved here in August. And um, it's a lovely place, and I want to thank the city council. This is the second city council meeting I've been to, and I appreciate that, in my observation, it's a group of very intelligent people who really care about this community, and I uh, definitely appreciate that kind of leadership. So 
Um, when we moved here, we did not know <laughs> about the traffic, so that was kind of a fun fact um, to discover that we couldn't get to or from our children or their practices. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, my husband commuting. And I, it was illuminating to hear in the beginning of this presentation, and thank you for all of this data because um, I used to be a scientist and so I love data. Um, and so, but it was, it was interesting to hear that the, the mission and the directive and the scope was limited to not increasing capacity, which I think from everybody I've talked to since we've been here, and we have only been here since August, and it sounds like this decision predates um, how long we've been here, but whoever made that decision aimed a trajectory in a direction that I think is surprising to most of the people who are, exper oh, most of the people who are experiencing the congestion. Um, it takes courage, I think, to make the effective decision rather than the easy one. Um, it sounds like there are a lot of really good data points pointing to the fact that the, con the congestion will not be relieved easily. Um, very creative solutions, I think, have been entertained. But I, and I encourage the city council to really be unapologetic about looking at these metrics. And uh, Councilman Martz. Um, articulated the exact same question that I had, which was, it looks like many of these things increase inputs into the system, but none of them increase throughput through or out of the system. And I think increasing capacity is, I mean, it seems to me to, you know, uh, somebody who um, isn't in the data all the time, but I mean, that's what it seems like to me. So anyways, I wanted to, th to thank all of you. Um, I think I just wanted to say, um, I know it's, it probably takes a lot of courage and it's difficult to, to do the effective solution, but you know, you have to do what works because if you spend $14 million on solutions that don't improve anything, you know, it, nobody remembers that it went back to a recommendation from a report or who did the report everybody just says, oh, it's Issaquah or it's King County. So, um, and that's who it, it kind of gets hung on. Um, but just, you know, thank you for being unapologetic about looking for the metrics and looking for what amount the improvement is. Thank you. Thank you. And um, ma'am? And I'd, I'd like to remind people in the audience to direct their comments to the council. Oh, as all opposed right. To, as opposed to, uh, you know, anybody else. It's okay. your time all right. with us. I'm, I'm happy and I'm pleased that you will allow us to say a few, uh, have a few comments. My name is Susan Harvey. I am the chair of the transportation committee for the Greater Maple Valley Unincorporated, I stress, Unincorporated Area Council. And uh, I have spoken with Ms. Chaffee, and uh, and and I um, we have a, a report. But when we heard about the report, and we realized that it was only t really taking effect from 18 North, uh, we live south, and so we were not really uh, what we have to endure in in the backups of the traffic and so on. We don't feel we're getting the representation because we're participating in all this traffic and yet really don't have any say. So uh, that's why we're here. We're 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 focusing now uh, as a as a group, and we've joined with three other unincorporated area councils, uh, going through the same situations, and we're going to emphasize uh, corridors like you are. Uh, the corridor, uh, the Issaquah Hobart Road corridor. I live in Ravensdale, uh, and the SR169 corridor through Maple Valley. And I, I want to stress the same point that I think you made. And I, if I could be blunt, I think you're throwing bad money. Oh, uh, you're throwing more money at a situation that isn't going to fix it. Also, I didn't hear you really think about the traffic coming off of I-90 that is feeding onto Front Street, because that's going to increase with the growth of the area. And then traveling along the Issaquah Hobart Road, um, you're going to have in Black Diamond 6,040 more residences all coming north. 
all commuting to the the Boeings and the Microsofts and so on and so on. And then the city of Maple Valley, and now we'll have 425 more homes. City of Covington is going to have roughly 1,700 more residences. So as you're doing your calculations, there's all the cities that are operating unilaterally as cities, but we're in the middle <laughs> of those roads. I would encourage you to think long term. I'm not gonna be around in 2040, but I don't wanna leave the legacy to any grandchildren I may have, thinking of, of that. I think I agree with, I think it was Councilman Ramos that was questioned, or no, maybe it was Chris, I don't remember, but who, who said, you know, if we're not gonna make a big difference, you know, why don't you do the bypass? Just bite the bullet and go big and make a difference. And that's my plea. Thank you very much for your comments. And I, it, yes, so somebody pantomimed uh, clapping. Thank you for not actually clapping. And for folks who have not been here before, one of the things that, one of the things we sort of do historically, if you, if you, if you feel moved by the speaker, if you'll raise your hand, that uh, allows for us to understand that there's some, uh, some resonance for the speaker. Uh, is anyone else wishing to speak, sir? Good evening. My name is Chris Rasmussen. I am a, a resident of the Miramont community. Uh, as you all know, it's on the Esquahobart Road. We also moved here in the past 18 months, unaware of the traffic issues on Esquahobart Road. During that time, we also welcomed the birth of our firstborn son, who is now four months old. And we are now challenged to travel, both my wife and our professionals, into and out of the city each day. It has become prohibitive for us to do this at this point. And last night, while I was sitting with my wife trying to figure out a way to solve for this problem, it came to a conclusion that we most likely will be selling our house in Miramont and moving somewhere closer to the city. Uh, this is directly related to the traffic here. Uh, public busing in Issaquah at the Issaquah Transit Center is something we both take advantage of. But in order to keep our son out of the 10-hour window of daycare that we're currently allowed, we cannot manage without alleviation of the traffic on the Issaquah Hobart Road corridor. That's all I wanted to say, and I wanted to challenge you all as well, as others have challenged. This is not a problem for us. This is a problem for the future. And we challenge ourselves as representatives of our population to think of the future. Think big and push for the solution that solves problems, not just for tomorrow or for a couple streets, but changes the impact in the entire region. I did do a little research as well into some of the developments that have been going on, and it's my understanding that King County in general has pushed for in increased revenue, I'm sorry, increased residential growth in the southeast region of the King County area. Um, that will not slow down. The population in the region is growing. Seattle is a booming city. And if we don't solve this, Issaquah, Covington, Newcastle, Black Diamond, these will all be areas that are left behind in the growth of the region. Thank you all. I appreciate your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, some support out there. Uh, is there anyone else wishing to speak to the, this or, if you feel so moved, the uh, I-90 Auxiliary Lane project uh, before we move on? Thank you again for your comments. Let us now move to ID 0234, Emergency Management with Brett Heath, our Public Works Operations Director. Sitting up, I'm gonna grab a coffee. Brett, always a pleasure. You wanna tell us what you're gonna talk about today? Yes, thank you. So, um, Brett Heath, Public Works Operations and Emergency Management Director for the City of Issaquah. Uh, and uh, tonight with me is also Brenda Bramwell, who is the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Issaquah. So she's going to, uh, her and I are gonna be working together a little bit on this presentation. 
And I just want to uh, thank the council for the opportunity to um, provide this overview of emergency management. Um, also, uh, hopefully, have some uh, answer some of your questions. If you have questions as we go along, please uh, please interject those. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we might have a little time at the end to answer questions as well. Um, so. What I want to do tonight is talk about emergency management, uh, kind of an update on where we're at on things, how emergency management works um, from the big picture, and what our, uh, some of our capabilities are. So, um, let me see here. Don't do that. <laughs> there we go. All right, so uh, for emergency management um, in general, FEMA, of course, has a, uh, a definition for emergency management. And uh, I prefer the simpler version, which is preparing for bad stuff. When it happens, you need to be ready for it. So that's kind of what we do with emergency management. And a lot of it is really about trying to build relationships, um, trying to, uh, the process of planning is, uh, you know, the benefit of the plans that we put together is, is really going through that process and, and building those relationships and thinking things through ahead of time. So uh, that's really kind of what we do in emergency management. And uh, we're going to kind of cover some of the uh, some of those areas tonight. Um, I, I should give you a heads up if you're looking at the presentation I sent ahead of time. I've tweaked it a little bit. It's a, the order is going to be slightly different, so we'll get you the updated version. But this one I think flows a little better than what I sent you. Contents is pretty much the same. Okay. Um, so what kind of hazards do we have? What are we facing here in the city of Issaquah with regards to hazards? Um, Western Washington has a, a lot of um, natural hazards um, just because of the area that we live in. We have volcanoes. Um, we, we saw what happened to St. Helens a number of years ago. Baker's active. Um, uh, St. Helens, of course, is still active. Uh, technically, Rainier's active. So there's a lot of potential for volcanoes. We live in an earthquake zone. Uh, we have, uh, we're, we're discovering more earthquake faults. Um, seems like uh, every couple months a new one pops up, uh, but we have a number of earthquake faults. Some of them run fairly close to the city, such as the Seattle Fault right through the southern half of, uh, of um, Lake Sammamish. So um, there's uh, quite a bit of potential for that. We've also, you've heard about the Cascadia Subduction Zone Fault. Uh, uh, that's been, was been in the news recently and continues to be in the news. And that uh, has the potential for a very large catastrophic uh, type earthquake in the region. In addition to that, we have uh, your typical, some of your other more typical, if you will, landslides, severe weather, severe winter weather. Um, we have urban interface wildfire potentials. We have some neighborhoods that are surrounded by heavy forest um, and somewhat isolated in their, in their accesses uh, for getting in and out of those neighborhoods. So, um, those are potentials, flooding, uh, dam failures. We have a number of, our dams fortunately are fairly small. We're not downstream from any large ones, but a number of our larger stormwater um, facilities are actually uh, official dams. So um, we have that. We have hazmat, uh, of course. We've experienced some of that. We also have uh, Sea Bernie, which is code for chemical, biological, nuclear, um, radiological, and explosive uh, stuff, bad stuff things we don't hope we have. Cyber attacks, of course. Issaquah is riddled with, um, shouldn't say riddled. Issaquah has a number of uh, uh, coal mines, um, Squawk Mountain um, on, on over into uh, uh, the uh, um, Cougar Mountain area and also in the Grand Ridge area. So coal mining uh, history here has, has uh, left its legacy and coal mines um, in certain areas can be hazards. We have pipeline, um, pipelines running through the area and of course utility fa failure. So those are all the types of hazards that we face here in Issaquah. Um, of those hazards, we've experienced most of them. Um, fortunately, not on a catastrophic scale to date, but the potential certainly exists for that, especially with uh, volcanoes and earthquakes. Um, wildfire could also uh, fall into that, that category. So, that's why we prepare. We have all of these hazards. We need to be um, prepared. And what we do in emergency management is we try and do an all-hazard approach. So we're looking at hazards in general and saying, how do we respond best to any of these, any of these hazards as they might uh, present themselves? So part of the, um, 
uh, well, any part of emergency management in general is, the mantra is, all disasters are local, right? They happen here, we have to respond, we're responsible for the initial response. So part of our, uh, part of our job is to make sure that we are going through and looking at, at how, do we, uh, how do we prepare for it, how do we respond to it, how do we um, mitigate, how do we recover, um, and that's all part of the emergency management planning cycle um, that you see up there in the, in the uh, Pentagon shape. So uh, those are the just different phases that we, that we go through. We spend a lot of time in, uh, pre in preparedness, um, frankly, and we hope to not spend too much time in response and recovery. Uh, mitigation, of course, is, uh, you know, the act of, of, uh, pr of uh, making changes so to lessen the impact of an event when it does happen. So uh, I'm going to, I want to talk quickly about some of the uh, responsibilities of emergency management and who does what, kind of give you a feel for uh, where we get our support during that. So during an event, uh, if we're having a response, we're going to be looking at, uh, of course, we're going to be responding initially, and then if we are out of resources or need additional help, we can request um, support from King County. So King County uh, runs the uh, King County uh, Emergency Coordination Center, and they're coordinating King County agencies and cities and other jurisdictions and agencies within King County. That's kind of their job during, a, during an event. Uh, we also can push resource requests up to the county, um, uh, any kind of resource request, something that we can't fill locally, we push it up to the county. Uh, they have the Regional Disaster Framework, which um, allows, uh, pulls in private um, as well as public agencies, and they would make the uh, countywide um, disaster uh, emergency proclamation. So um, kind of what the county provides, they're an operational um, entity, and they're going to be involved if it's a, anything out, Issaquah or bigger, um, they're certainly going to be involved. They activate to support um, local agencies as well. So even if it's just is a cross-centric, um, they would activate to support us. If the county can't, um, uh, if the county is uh, running out of resources or doesn't have the resources to handle the situation, they then push resource requests up to the state level. And the State Emergency Operations Center then starts coordinating the um, effort uh, and filling resource requests. So again, we're, we're still responding locally. We're still responsible for, for um, uh, responding to and, and handling the situation at the local level. But these are places we can go to get additional resources uh, to, to help us in that. There's a couple of things that the state has at their disposal. There's EMAT, which is the Emergency Management Assistance Compact. And that compact is an interstate compact uh, across the entire country. So they can request resources um, from any other state, and uh, we see that typically uh, a lot during the hurricane season. Um, EMAC re resource requests will actually come all the way up to Washington if they are starting to run short in other states. Uh, there's the uh, Washington Mutual or Interstate Mutual Aids, Washington Mutual Aid System, WAMAS. Um, that allows uh, cooperation with political en entities within the uh, state of Washington, also includes the tribes, and. Uh, so that's available for us. The nice thing about WAMAS is it also includes training and exercises. So we can uh, um, operate underneath that as well. National Guard resources, a big uh, piece that the state provides. They can mobilize National Guard. And then uh, they also issue state em emergency proclamations. And on the back end, uh, also typically, they're not obligated to, but they, the legislator, legislature typically provides a portion of of uh, public assistance funding in a presidentially declared disaster. So they are involved in a bit of that funding. Then we have the federal level. Once um, something gets pushed up to the federal level, uh, we have, um, um, there's a pres presidential disaster declaration. That frees up a lot of money. And frankly, that's what the federal government brings to bear on a disaster is money generally after the fact. Uh, they do have some specialized teams that are available um, to deploy, things like med emergency medical teams, search and rescue teams, mortuary teams. They have a, a, a number of teams like that that they can, can deploy, but uh, their, their focus is really um, trying to make the community whole after a disaster and helping out in the recovery phase. They are not 
a local response agency. There's um, misconceptions on that uh, out there around the country, but they're not the folks that are gonna be there on typically on day one to respond to something. And when they do arrive, um, they do not take over the operation. They work with uh, local jurisdiction uh, in, and support the operation that's going on. So that's the responsibilities that we have or how they're kind of laid out um, from local all the way up to federal. Um, so during an event, this is kind of the sequence of events in, in a real broad sense of what we go through. So Issaquah responds, King County responds, um, providing resources to us and around the county. Um, the state then can respond, bringing in more resources, bringing in the National Guard resources. Um, FEMA, feds can then also respond with specialized teams if necessary. Um, and then we start w doing what we call the preliminary damage assessment process. And that's where we're going out looking at all the damages and putting a number to those damages. And we're submitting that information to the county and the county's collecting it for all of the um, uh, entities within the county that are eligible for that uh, public assistance money. Every county is doing that. They then submit that information to the state and the state looks at it and if the county hits their threshold, King County is about seven million then King County can be included in a state disaster declaration request to FEMA. So then the state makes that request to FEMA, FEMA evaluates the request, if it meets their criteria, it goes on to the president, president decides, signs a disaster declaration. Once a disaster declaration is signed, then the public assistance and individual assistance funds become available and that's kind of when the money um, starts coming in to the community and a lot of the other support, um, uh, federal support becomes available, okay? So that's kind of how um, scenarios play out. And this, we've seen this play out a number of times in floods, winter storms, and other events in Issaquah. Um, this is fairly standard process. Uh, I think the Nisqually earthquake shortcutted it a little bit because of the uh, coverage that CNN was giving Seattle. Um, the president signed the declaration before all of the paperwork was done. But that doesn't normally happen. So normally that presidential declaration is a ways down the road, it can be days to a couple of weeks after an event starts before we get a, a presidential declaration. So it's kind of a, how that works in a nutshell. Um, one of the big pieces that's part of our preparedness, I wanna talk a little bit about preparedness now, big piece of our preparedness operation is our volunteers. And we have a, 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 a lot of people that volunteer for Issaquah, and I wanna let uh, Brenda talk to the volunteers. She's done a great job of, of putting this program together. So, Brenda? Good evening. So as you, as you have seen in the last few slides, there's quite a few hazards out there that could affect the city of Issaquah. And what we do now as we prepare, uh, what partnerships we create will, will affect the, the future of Issaquah and the quality of life that we would have. So the city of Issaquah through emergency management has involved the community members in preparation. So one of our greatest focus is training and engaging the community members through a uh, like a volunteer force through community emergency response team. And as we all know, people have the greatest capacity to care for one another, people they work with, people they go to church with or go to school with. And so when disaster happens, they will come. And so what better opportunity to harness that power now in advance of the disaster, have them trained and, and and in that regard, they become known to us as well. So Community Emergency, emergency Response Team, uh, that CERT, was started by Brett in 2005. So we now have 34 classes and 750, 750 people who, are, who have gone through that program. Actually, 40 of them will be graduating or going through the disaster simulation this Saturday, and 20 of those are from Timber Ridge. So uh, 100 people have been trained in Costco and also Providence Point have their own certs and so they, they are ready to respond to their communities when disaster happens. So out of this um, uh, 700 plus people, we retain a few of those that continually wanna in, be engaged in the community. They 
they proceed to get more classes like incident command classes, and they also get their background checks and their credentials uh, logged with the city of Issaquah. And so those are your registered emer emergency workers, and we have around 200 of those, 200 to 225. And we also have the Issaquah Communication Support Team. That's our ham radio folks. And they're not just ham radio folks, they are you can call it ham and steroids guys, mm -hmm. because they are very well trained. They have technical expertise, they come from Microsoft, and, and they bring the old and the new together, and they are truly a communications team. That's what we call ICAST. We also have a medical reserve corps, which is comprised of medical doctors, nurses, and para paramedical personnel who works with Public Health Reserve Corps in King County in both disasters and non-disaster times. So they help with the homeless, veterans stand down, and around October of every year, we also help with the uh, Seattle King County Free Clinic, and we provide as much as millions, uh, six million dollars worth of free services to people who don't have insurance, we, uh, without asking for any, any, um, you know, if they are living in in Seattle or or things like that. They just get accepted. We also have our Map Your Neighborhood program, which is Neighbors Helping Neighbors. It's kind of like your family preparedness, but to a degree extending it to your neighborhood. And uh, we have something new but that you call Functional Assessment Service Team. Um, this sir, is a group of people who will serve the population in a shelter. It will make sure that everyone has the same access to services in a shelter, um, the same as people who have, um, um, who have access for general needs. Um, and we have our incident management team support staff. They are trained to support our incident management team. They are highly trained in ICS. They, they get trained with all the other softwares and systems and processes and method methodologies that we have at the EOC. So can they, they can truly support us when we have disasters. So what kind of training do the volunteers get? Like I said, incident command system training, incident management team position specific training, and that means are they at logistics operations or are they part of the planning section? At the planning section, there are a lot of things there that they need to be trained on. Uh, they also train on post-earthquake inspection, ATC 20, and they could help and augment our building inspector should the need arise. A Red Cross shelter training. We also have our pets team, our uh, uh, pets emergency team for sheltering. And they will be uh, activated if there's ever a need for us to shelter our pets as well. Um, amateur radio training, community points of distribution. Uh, what this, uh, you've seen this as You've seen this happening from behind a truck where people are passing on goods, but community point of distribution is primarily uh, cars, cars who are coming and uh, the volunteers putting goods in the back of those cars. Sandbagging, um, believe me, there's an art to sandbagging. Wilderness first aid, CPR first aid, and training for the functional assessment service team as well. Oh, I'll let you do that. Thanks, Brenda. So uh, volunteer program is a big piece of our emergency management um, preparedness part. Uh, it's kind of cool, I was just thinking the other day, uh, we have 700 certs that we've trained, 700 people have been through the cert program. You know, if they, this is just hypothetical math, but um, you know, if they can help uh, 10 families, um, each one of those helps 10 families, that's, uh, um, what, 7,000 families? Well, theoretically, that's half the households in Issaquah. So, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty amazing when you start thinking about the multiplication factor that we can get out of people that have been through the CERT program. So, um, pretty cool stuff. Um, so, preparedness um, also includes planning. So we, pr uh, we do plans, emergency operation procedures. Uh, the big plan that we do is the Comprehensive, Emer Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, the CEMP. 
Um, we just updated that in 2016, so the next update's uh, um, 2021 on that uh, plan. We're also working on, we've updated our COOP plan, and that's in final review. Um, uh, debris uh, management plan, that's been sent off to FEMA. Um, and we've got a number of uh, other things going on. One of the cool things that I'll mention, uh, Brenda worked on with Eastside Fire and Rescue is the, um, the disaster response plan for adult care homes. And that's a really neat um, thing where they went out to the adult care homes, um, kind of tried to engage them, get them involved. Um, I think the Timber Ridge kind of grew out of that. So Timber Ridge is now, um, Timber Ridge residents especially are getting very involved. They just, uh, they have a CERT class going on at the moment. And uh, they're getting very um, interested in how they can help themselves during a disaster. They've uh, um, gone through and divided their floors up and, and um, figured out how they're going to organize themselves and how they're going to communicate amongst themselves. So very cool stuff going on with, uh, with some, of this, uh, some of this planning. Um, training is another part of preparedness. Um, we're fo we've been focusing on incident management team training. And uh, we've been working on command positions, the general staff positions, was that your chiefs, logistic chiefs, planning chief, et cetera. Um, unit leaders, staff positions. IE Suites is a tracking um, program used by DNR. I should say one of our goals in the emergency management team is to be able to, um, if we have an incident that is larger than what Issaquah can handle, there's the opportunity uh, for to bring in other teams, the teams that manage wildfires typically, those are um, type two or type one incident management teams. Uh, so our goal is to be aligned with how they operate and this is some of the software that they use. So when we respond and when we start up an operation, if it gets, grows larger than what Issaquah can handle and we need to pass that um, system off to uh, a uh, more experienced um, team, then uh, we would have our our, everything would be lined up for them to come in and do that. And they only last a little while and then they go away and have to hand it back down to the local. So we get it at the beginning and we would get it at the end um, in that particular scenario. So we're trying to use systems that they use and speak their language. Um, Web EOC, that's, uh, state uses that. King County's now rolled that out, um, some of the improvements they've been working on. And they've made that, uh, King County's made it available to loc uh, local um, entities. And so we are now on the, uh, working with uh, King County on Web EOC, which allows us access to, for resource management and um, situational awareness. All hazard IMT training, we had an opportunity to bring in some experts, uh, spent a week training the incident management team last fall. Um, these are the folks that respond to the hurricanes. Um, they came here, matter of fact, they came off of a hurricane, did the training, and then went back to a hurricane. So um, they, it was very, very valuable um, team training for our incident management team, and we learned a lot from that. Uh, rapid tag system, that's uh, resource tracking, type two shadowing, that's something we try and get our incident management team um, folks out to, uh, that's shadowing type two teams typically on a wildfire. So it gives them some experience to see how does, what's this position look like when it's, when it's working under stress. Exercises, uh, we involved in exercises for preparedness. The uh, last big one we did was Cascadia subduction zone uh, exercise in 2016. Um, that was a big exercise. We brought in uh, uh, National Guard came into Issaquah. Um, uh, State uh, Washington was involved, King County, up, um, King County and other counties, a number of counties in, uh, in Western Washington, as well as the federal government. So FEMA was involved in that exercise too. Um, we had a number of issues that we identified out of that in our after action report and we've been uh, pretty successful at ticking those off. A lot of those were training related and uh, the training that we've been doing over the last year and the IMT training we did last fall really helped us uh, meet some of, those, uh, some of those issues that were identified. So that's coming along real well. The incident management team, we did tabletop in 15, we do an annual earthquake exercise, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes, I mean, we do a lot of exercising. It's really where you find out where the issues are at. You can plan all you want, but until you try it out, you don't know how it's gonna work. So one of the things we found out when we were trying things out was um, our old way of operating wasn't working as efficiently as it could. 
uh, we had department operating centers, so we'd have a police and a fire and a public works operating center, and we'd have an EOC that was trying to sort of manage what was going on. And uh, uh, we said, you know, that's not really working. And um, uh, I'll say thanks to Steve Westlake with Eastside Fire and Rescue, who was on an incident management team. He said, hey, why don't we reorganize this under an incident management team concept? So sounded like a great idea, so we embarked on that a few years ago, and uh, we've reorganized and we're now operate under incident management team regardless of what the uh, the activity is. And that basically puts all of the city departments and any other agencies that are assisting us and our volunteers all under incident command, um, all working together on one team. So we don't have a bunch of um, one operation doing this, another operation over here doing that. It's all part of the team. So anytime a department uh, finds itself um, with its resources exceeded, you can request the incident management team. Um, sometimes Brenda and I will say, hey, it looks like you could use help, and uh, do you need some help? And they'll say, yeah, that would be great. So we'll go in and, and do some of the planning work or some of the other things that, uh, uh, that they wouldn't normally be involved with as an operating uh, department. So it, it includes all of the sections that you typically see in incident command, planning operations, et cetera. Our mission is to make, basically manage all the incidents. Um, we integrate it under incident command. Uh, we report to the mayor. It's un organized under the in incident command system, and it's basically management by objectives. Um, all of the functions for emergency management are included under the emergency management team as well. So if it's uh, an emergency, abnormal operations and we have the incident management team running, we're going to be, it's going to fall under that, that umbrella. So it doesn't really matter what it is. In summary, it um, can be any kind of incident. It's going to, uh, incident management team is going to be there to manage it. Um, some of the assets the incident management team has, these are Issaquah at, um, local assets. These are not all of them, but we have, uh, we have fuel, we have generators, we have a uh, trailer with shelter supplies in it. We have a communications gateway, which allows us to connect together radio systems and telephones that are on uh, different bands and different frequencies. So when agency A shows up and agency B shows up and they have different communication systems than what we're operating, we can plug them into the uh, gateway and um, uh, use the software to connect up the radios. So it's a pretty cool system. Uh, we also have some very basic things like the big yellow board down there at the bottom. That's a what we call a trap line. And in the event communication systems are not working, um, we will put these boards out in strategic locations around the city and go around and staple updates to them. And people can read the information, get the information that way. It's very basic. Um, but it's a way of getting information out. We also have a communications uh, trailer that the ham radio um, folks have been working on, ICAST, and uh, doing a great job of upgrading that. That was purchased with an emergency management grant. So a uh, number of um, assets that uh, Issaquah has specifically for response. Part of also our response is we've divided the city up into 14 um, zones. We call them rapid impact survey zones because uh, we created this to uh, quickly gather damage assessment following an, uh, uh, following an event. Um, and we've now taken this, it originally started off with public works, fire, police, et cetera. We've been training the certs um, in this and also ICAST participates as well, the communications team. And the certs now do regular drills, um, doing damage assessments and communications. Um, and frankly, if we have an after hours event, um, they're gonna be done doing the assessments before we get something really up and rolling, which will be great uh, because we'll have um, information right away as soon as we need it. So um, they certs have been really uh, done a good job with that. We also use it um, to form cert teams. So that's the uh, rapid impact survey. Um, in our zones. We also have uh, mutual aid that's available to the city of Issaquah. Uh, we have the King County Regional, uh, King County, um, <laughs> the um, Regional Coordination Framework. They've changed the name on this a couple times. So uh, anyway, it's currently called the Regional Coordination Framework and this brings together private entities as well as public. So there's quite a few resources available under that. The, I mentioned, uh, oh, I haven't mentioned this one yet. Emergency management assistance teams, those are teams made up typically of emergency managers in King County that can help other cities or other entities um, during a disaster. Brenda and I um, serve on, 
on an EMAT team as well. Uh, the mutual aid system, I already mentioned that. Um, happy to say that Issaquah was instrumental in getting that through the legislature and signed into law back in 13. Uh, fire mobilization, there's law enforcement mobilization, there's PANEMA, which is an international agreement because it includes BC and the Yukon, uh, but it's a lot like EMAC, uh, just sharing resources amongst um, states and uh, uh, provinces. And then the EMAC, which I already mentioned, the assistance compact, which is interstate. So a number of resources that are available for response. Then we get into recovery and mitigation. So recovery is, um, that's a long-term process. That can be uh, weeks to months, um, depending on if you get a catastrophic event. Frankly, it can be years that you're in recovery. So uh, initially, that would involve the, the incident management team, but that would probably quickly um, start transferring into um, ongoing departmental functions within the city. Development services would be heavily involved, economic development, chamber of commerce, businesses. Um, it really involves bringing the whole community together to figure out how you're going to recover from a catastrophic event. Mitigation, of course, that's preparing, as I mentioned, preparing for something before it happens or taking some structural steps like raising houses and, and seismic retrofits and um, things along those lines. So mitigation uh, is, is an ongoing practice as well. Um, community partners, we have a number of community partners. Brenda, do you want to say a word about community partners? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Did you, you want to? Okay. So emergency, we have a number of partners here. We just listed them up here. These are really, um, and I want to let Brenda get some credit for this, but she's gone out and really um, worked with a lot of these folks, and they do different things for, uh, for the city. For instance, uh, Faith United Methodist Church, they were working on sea pods, um, the points of distribution for the for the city. Um, Issaquah Highlands Council, Christy Gerard up there, she's um, very involved in, in our, working with us in our exercises and helping out wherever, wherever she can. Um, um, school district has been involved in our sheltering exercises, providing transportation and communications. Um, uh, balanced physical therapy is, is, uh, has uh, made themselves available for helping out with sheltering and um, special, um, special needs kinds of things. Sportsman's Club, um, yeah, Timber Ridge, uh, East Ridge Christian, uh, Lakeside Industries, um, they were great during uh, one of our previous disasters providing fuel. Um, they kind of kept the operation going with uh, giving us access to their fueling system. So a um, lot of great partners out there in the community. So, miss anything? All right, so um, council roles. We have some brand new, hot off the press, <laughs> guides for elected officials for you. Um, this is an update of one that was uh, previously provided. Uh, Brenda worked on this, uh, um, put the original one together a couple of years ago and has recently updated it. Um, the goal of this guide is to really um, provide you with some basic information about emergency management, about your roles, um, the mayor's role, um, uh, how, the system, how the system works. So what kind of uh, council roles, um, to sum them up, there's a number of them you'll find in there right up front. We tried to put the council information in the front there. Um, but uh, you know, uh, supporting the response effort, if you have an issue with the response effort, please let the mayor know. We wanna make sure we're all on the same page when we're, do when we're responding. Uh, community leadership, of course, um, being a liaison with the community and, and providing feedback, um, authorizing emergency expenditures as necessary, conducting public meetings and determining policy, um, and coordinating, making sure messages are coordinating, uh, coordinated with our public information officer. You'll also find in there information on emergency management organization, the phases of emergency management, um, NIMS, uh, and then there's a glossary and a list of acronyms to help you out with what on earth did that mean? So <laughs> that's, uh, that's available for you, so I hope you find it useful. Put it someplace where it's available, your car, your purse, your back pocket. Um, uh, keep it handy, and because uh, if something goes wrong, we want it to be a, a quick guide for you, okay? All right, so um, kind of summarize things up and wrap this up. 
it's all about being personally prepared. So we can do a lot of work on the emergency management end of things, but we really need people to be prepared. So for you and for our listening audience tonight, or our viewing audience tonight, um, I really want to stress making sure that uh, the personal preparedness piece of this. So that means, you know, having a plan, talking about with your family, do you have a designated meeting place, uh, what's your communications plan, and it, you know, without a cell phone um, or your normal means of communication, how are you going to communicate with one another? Uh, do you have an out of area contact? And then getting a kit put together. And uh, sometimes that's overwhelming. You can buy one, you can build one, but start somewhere and start getting a kit together. Get involved. Um, uh, Mayor Pauly's uh, in the current CERT class, which is great. Love to have see some more of you guys uh, in our CERT classes. It'd be wonderful if you can do that. Um, but that's one way to do it. Or you can uh, work with your neighborhood on Map Your Neighborhood. So we can do training specifically for that as well. Bottom line is, whatever you, once you do all of this, Practice it, uh, and when I say practice it, I mean turn the power off, turn the water off, pretend you don't have any gas, and uh, see how well your plan works. No cell phones, you know, none of that. Take all the technology away and take away the basic services and see how, how well, see if your plan survives. And if it doesn't, change your plan. Tweak it and try it again, but you gotta practice this stuff, so. That's the bottom line, and I'll leave you with this. Uh, on your left, you'll see the uh, shake map from Nisqually. Uh, the top of the red arrow there is roughly where Issaquah is at, and you'll notice that it's pretty much green, which means the shaking was moderate. You'll notice on your right, another shake map, and that is the Seattle Fault 6.7 scenario, and you'll notice the top of the arrow is all red. That is violent to extreme shaking. And Nisqually lasted 45 seconds. Um, the uh, Seattle Fault and or the Subduction Fault are both gonna last a lot longer. So much more violent shaking and a longer duration. So what we saw, we had damages in the uh, Nisqually, um, Nisqually earthquake. We lost, uh, not catastrophic loss, but we lost two water reservoirs as a result of it. We had damage to a number of buildings around Issaquah. Um, uh, we had some damage to road systems. Um, so, you know, and that was with moderate shaking. So, bottom line is, are you ready? And uh, thank you. Any questions? Questions? So, I'll, I've got a couple. First off, uh, do we have one of the uh, risks that you did not mention is contagion? And, uh, um, company I work for was involved in the response to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And uh, do we have, if, you know, if we had a scenario, I mean, let's say, you know, a, a, a not worst case scenario is a third of the police and a third of city staff and a third of firefighters are homesick, mm -hmm. right? And are being told not to come to work because they may have a dangerous contagious disease. Those sorts of scenarios, are you guys involved in preparing for that and, and do you train for that? So um, it's a great question. Our continuity of operations plan is that's kind of the, um, the focus of that, identifying what the essential functions are and how you keep government running. Uh, when you don't have um, a majority of your staff here. So um, Brenda's uh, worked on that, and like I said, the final draft is on my, on my desk for review. Um, but that's one of the ways that we address that, is, is looking at our operations and saying, how do, we do, how do we do what we absolutely have to do, right? How do we keep the lights on? How do we pay the bills? Um, how do we keep the water running? Um, keep the sewage going where it's supposed to, those kinds of operations when we're, when we're down. And that's what the, the, the COOP plan is. So yes, we are, we are planning for that. We have not exercised for that, if you will, at this point. Um, we will be looking at probably table topping that once we get the, the plan finalized as well. We also work with, um, I've been working with uh, Department of Health on medical distribution um, it's medical distribution points, I'll just call it that for the, the term is slipping my mind, but it's where they will do bulk distribution um, in particular areas. So we have been working with uh, uh, the, um, the health department on that as well. Does that answer your question? It does. The second part of my question is, um, have we been working on hardening our power systems? For those of us who are here for the big, the two big storms in late 2006, 
Uh, the distribution of power outages in, this, in the city was not uniform. Uh, those of us on Squawk got a longer amount of time to acquaint ourselves with generators. And my understanding is Issaquah is somewhat unique and we have a number of different, um, different parts of the city have different power uh, coming from different directions. And this leads to different, uh, uh, different uh, risk of, of uh, I impact um, from storms and whatnot. Have, have we been working on that? And is, is, are there ways that we as a city can make progress on that? So, City of Issaquah, uh, the substation that serves the um, City of Issaquah has, from my understanding with uh, Puget Sound Energy, is there's eight feeds going into it. 2006, I believe it was, all of those feeds were knocked out. So in order for them to get power back to the city, they first have to rebuild all of those feeds. So that takes quite a while. Um, and then you have uh, different types of power infrastructure. So on Squawk Mountain, there's a lot of overhead power infrastructure, which is very susceptible to damage from all of the trees that we have up there. Um, Issaquah Highlands is a different situation. Beyond that, um, I don't have a lot of information on that. Um, I could get that if, if that would be of interest to you to see what PSE is doing with it. Um, we are, from, from a uh, city perspective, we know what we have in the way of assets or facilities in those areas and how we're going to um, power those, uh, those facilities during, a, uh, during an event. But, but for general businesses and homes, um, I know there's been some discussion on that, but I don't know the latest. Because I thought some parts of the city were actually served by power that comes over the pass, but other parts of the city get their power coming east from, from Seattle and and Bellevue. And yeah, that's uh, specific power grid information. I'm not aware of the details of it. You're right, it comes from, yeah. it, and it comes from the south. It also comes down from the north. Um, those are those main feeder lines that come into the, the uh, substation that's on the Lake Tradition Plateau. And I thought that was part of the 2006 issue was the power that came over the pass was really impacted uh, more heavily by the, by the storm. Yes. The, the third major question I have is around the Cascadia Rising, yes. uh, Cascadia Subduction Fault Exercise that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not a topic for tonight, but uh, I know there were uh, outcomes from that uh, event and there were lessons learned, not really at the city of Issaquah level, but at the, uh, at the county level and at the state level and at the multi-state level. And I would love it at some point this year uh, to get an update from you on what those lessons learned were and how that maps to our own efforts. Because I know one of the areas was that, um, one of the recommendations was to integrate closer with major retailers and major mm -hmm. businesses to see how they can be involved in the response. And I know Costco has one of the most uh, comprehensive emergency response plans in the event of, a, of an emergency. Um, but that kind of uh, recommendation is the kind of thing that I would love to know that we are integrating our plans with. Great, yeah, we'd be happy to do that. So we will set something up. And the final thing is I'm thrilled that we have a mutual assistance pact with the Yukon. Uh, I was lucky enough to drive through the Yukon and while it's the size of California, it actually has less people than the city of Issaquah, but it's good to know that they'd be there for us. <laughs> Other questions? Nope, thank okay. you so much. Appreciate right. your thank you. presentation and your hard work. All right, and we are on to the last item of the night, which is ID 0262, Transit Oriented Development Update with Jen Davis Hayes, yeah, our Economic right. Development Jump. Manager. Okay. Oh, I should ask, I'm sorry, before you start, is there anybody from the public that wanted to speak to this issue of emergency management this evening? No. Okay. Sorry. Just wanted to be That's good. comprehensive. And I, I will add, actually, um, not any detailed information, but I know that Andrea Snyder, my ex coworker who has moved on, um, worked a lot with PSC around uh, redundancy of power as well as quality. So I know that she presented in the past to council, and we can we can find that information and that and then also find out what else. PSE is doing in the future, or currently in the future, but that was a, obviously for businesses is a, a big concern because losing power also means losing inventory, losing money, et cetera. So, yes. Thanks. Yeah. 
So um, thank you. So my name, uh, again, is Jen Davis Hayes, work here at the City in Economic Development. And uh, tonight, we're gonna be talking about the transit-oriented development um, project. And so we are gonna be back on the, uh, to council for a work session on May 14th, and where we're gonna have a more in-depth conversation. So tonight, we wanted to reintroduce the project. Uh, for those of you who've been in council before, you've heard about this project in many different ways. And so we've come to you in different chunks. We've talked about it as purchasing the property. We've talked about it as short, as short platting the property. We've talked about it with the multifamily tax exemption. We've talked about it um, with the, uh, the funding from ARCH. And so while you may have had, met, had many touches, um, you know, we, we wanted to try to uh, present the information that's happened so far all together, and then for the new council members, uh, provide a, a background, and then also present you with the policy questions that we expect to discuss on May 14th. So we're not going to be talking about details of that tonight, but that hope that you, you can begin to think about it. If there's questions you have tonight that you've identified that you want us to address on the May 14th, then we'll have some time to do some research and bring that information to you. Also, we'll, um, you'll be getting an email tomorrow from me if you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one briefing about this project. So that's our intent tonight. Um, it was intended to be a really quick overview. Um, and so the transit-oriented development project, you kind of ask, you know, why are we doing this? So um, as it says up here, it really aligns with our vision that we have in the Central Issaquah Plan. Um, as you guys know, uh, because we're working a lot of, on it with the moratorium, is that we currently have not had any affordable housing built in the Central Issaquah area. This would create a substantial number of units. Out of the 355 units that would be in this project, 175 would be affordable from the 40 to 80% AMI, area median income. But not only that, it's gonna create the, the type of building that we wanna see in Central Issaquah, that has the, the connectedness to the streets, that ties into the amenities in the area. So it's located um, right across the street from Tibbetts Valley Park, next to a transit center, uh, walking distance to several grocery stores, uh, professional offices, other services. And so when we talk about wanting to have a community where people can live, work, play, this is really our, our place to do that. Um, but right now, there is a, currently a business located at this site, and that is the CenturyLink Operations. So they park their trucks there, they pull in their personal cars, get into their truck, and move out. There's a, a small portion of office space there, but mostly it's to hold uh, a little bit of supplies and uh, to park their trucks. We, uh, as you know, so the picture on the, the uh, Right is uh, the relocation site that we will be working with our development team to move uh, CenturyLink to. So this is the King County property that we purchased. Right now, uh, it was a former King County Roads portion that you see outlined there. And that's in our um, intensive commercial uh, zoning area, which makes a lot of sense for this type of use. So moving a uh, use that's very uh, warehouse auto oriented uh, out of our urban core into this other area makes a lot of sense. Any questions about location? Yep. Um, so, as I mentioned, there are many components of the TOD that we're really excited about. We have not had any uh, mixed use buildings that have occurred yet either in the Central Issaquah area. This one not only will have, um, again, affordable housing, but will have commercial space on the, on the bottom ground level floor. The uh, current plans are for um, the Opportunity Center, which we're gonna be talking about tonight, uh, which is a space for nonprofits that the city will uh, be own, own, but the development team also brought in two private uh, tenants, a daycare and a kidney center. So they'll have a lot of uh, interaction between those, those uses and the residents above. And as I mentioned before, the connection to the amenities. So they're going to actually be uh, installing or creating a new street grid between Newport and Maple. Um, they'll have a mid-block crossing that connects to the tra transit center um, entranceway, and then a quarter acre uh, public plaza that is on the side of uh, Newport uh, in Tibbetts Valley Park. And so again, making sure that the, the building design is, is uh, playing well with what's around it. And so this is showing the current concept. And so I guess I should have said in the beginning, um, we have, this is a little different of a concept plan. It's very con conceptual here um, that you've seen in the past because we've been working with a development team um, to fit all the needs of what we, what we want in here. So in the past, um, there were two, uh, two larger, so they, I'm sorry, so the reddish coral color are the retail, ground floor retail 
our commercial uses. Um, and then that green area, that's a different color green, um, on the north side by Newport Way, that's the public plaza. And then you can see that little stepping line through here. This is the mid-block crossing and then the new road. So we're looking at potentially the Opportunity Center would be located here. The yellow are the uh, residential amenities, so the lobby, the, you know, the, um, the fitness room, et cetera. And the daycare and the kidney center would be on this side. Any questions initially about the, yep, good. Big Council Member Hunt. Yes. Uh, daycare, would that be the daycare for the building or would that be a daycare? Public open to anybody, yes. Okay. They did say they would set aside some uh, slots for lower income individuals, so. Council Member Ray. So is the white area, is that parking kind of open space? So that is parking. So that actually is the residential tower. So they're gonna, there's going to be uh, structured parking, and then there'll be um, five levels of housing. And there'll be surface parking as well as structured parking, or just structured parking? So that will be on deck parking, is that correct? It's all structured parking. It's all structured parking. This goes, goes down, that's right, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just showing from the above here. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Council Deputy President Batiste. Thank you, Jen. Uh, what is the square footage um, for the Opportunity Center and then for the commercial? So the Opportunity Center is 10,000 square feet. The um, daycare is about uh, 14, I believe, and then the kidney center is about 10 or 11,000. Thank you. Yeah. So just a little over 30,000 square feet. Okay. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's, uh, we have been working, even though you haven't seen us, uh, you've seen us in little dribs and drabs, and this is a really complex project with many par partners. Um, so as I'm looking over here, I should have uh, announced earlier that I am, um, we have our, one of our development partners here, Hal Ferris from uh, Spectrum De De uh, Development Solutions, um, and also David Fujimoto, who's with our Office of uh, Sustainability, has been working with us on the Opportunity Center piece of this. Um, and so, uh, as in any complex project, you, you get so far and you learn that, okay, there's two more things we need to address. But we, we are looking at this figure here of kind of separating out, so looking at the funding, which most of the funding is coming from um, private investment, equity, and other resources outside the city of, of, of Issaquah. We did receive a $10 million King County TOD fund award, the project did. Um, that was applied for by the King County uh, Housing Authority, which is our other development partner. And a $2 million Arch Trust Fund investment that was approved earlier this year by uh, the city. And then also last year you did um, approve the uh, multifamily tax exemption for this project alone as a pilot project. Um, so that gives you a little bit idea of, of where all, there's actually you know, more sources, but that's kind of what's, what we've pr progressed upon. The development team will continue to, f to get financing and all those other things to make this uh, project whole. Uh, we also, we, so we split it up into the project site and the relocation property. So the project site is the TOD, so next to the transit center. The relocation property is where CenturyLink will move. So um, as I mentioned, uh, for the relocation property, we've had to purchase it. We've had to annex it into the city. We've had to uh, clean that up, and we've actually submitted the final report to the Department of Ecology. We're waiting to get back that notice of no further, the no further action letter from them. We're working on the short plat now um, and fi finalizing that, and then our next step will be to actually uh, to work with, uh, to negotiate and bring forward a development agreement about this site. The partners for that development agreement will be CenturyLink, Spectrum, and the city, okay? Because it's about moving CenturyLink there and our relationship with that. Do you have some questions? I had, nope, okay. Um, and then the project site, which is the, the, the project that we want to see happen, um, we will have a separate development agreement for that, and that development agreement will be between the two project, the development partners, so King County Housing Authority and, and Spectrum, and the city. So when you, we come back later, we'll have two separate uh, development agreements, but they will be related, obviously, because they will be uh, referring to each other because of all the pieces that go into that. But CenturyLink doesn't need to be involved in the agreement for their old site, and King County Housing Authority doesn't need to be in the agreement about this, the, King, the CenturyLink site, so it made sense to do it too. 
But for the project site, um, we are can, we're here tonight to talk about the Opportunity Center. We did an RFP um, late last year, and um, and then that's what uh, we're moving forward on on. Um, continuing to do CenturyLink, to collaborate with CenturyLink, but we'll be here back here for uh, the development agreement. So uh, again, again, I mentioned that on May 14th, we're gonna be back to council to talk about the Opportunity Center. So um, the uh, co community meeting we will plan to have after a decision is, is made on the Opportunity Center and where we're going with that, and I'm gonna be talking about that in a second. And then the development agreement, that's really where all the pieces come together. So we've talked about it at several council meetings, and I had that in your memo, the multiple times we've been here for decisions and for even for briefings. The development agreement is going to be that final document that, docu that solidifies and documents all those pieces. So saying you're going to provide you know, between 173 and 177 units of affordable housing. You're going to do these things, and it'll be signed uh, approved by city council, signed by the mayor, signed by all the parties. So um, that will be coming uh, later this year, which we're really excited about. Um, so before we go into what we wanna talk about on May 14th, we also wanted to let you know, so what are the future policy considerations? So things that we'll be back to you about. So one of the things that we're gonna be talking about on the 14th is additional city investments. So one for the Opportunity Center. Um, we are also looking at a potentially um, an impact fee request, um, I'm sorry, impact fee waiver request um, for the daycare. Um, the, I don't get into all the details, but the traffic, uh, impact fee for the daycare is uh, about a um, out of 1.2 million dollars of of um, impact fees and so we're looking at uh, it does it make sense it, there are some other ways to look at that and perhaps provide a discount like like some other cities do for that um, and then the development agreement negotiations there will be some requests looking at the ar architectural and design manual that was just passed there's already some um, adjustments that may be necessary to make the building work um, we'll have details about the land transaction. We'll want to make sure we document the timeline and any risk assumptions. What if something happens, CenturyLink decides not to do something, Spectrum you know, decides not to do something, we change our mind. We're, we'll put all those details in there and say what happens if. Um, and then for right now, if we don't get the letter, uh, the no further action letter, um, by the time we approve the development agreements, what other way can we uh, make sure that the relocation site uh, remediation, there's some assurance that there's not gonna be uh, liability for a CenturyLink. So those are some things we're gonna be talking to you later about. Any questions? Okay, now what are we gonna talk to you about next time? <laughs> So, um, as I mentioned, the, so the Opportunity Center, we're calling it Opportunity Center. Um, it's a, it was in the original request for proposals from developers, um, it requested a 10,000 square foot commercial space that would be deeded at no cost to the city um, for, we would, we would create, uh, we would uh, select a, a nonprofit to provide services there. We, um, last year, published an RFP for nonprofits, looking at what our priority service needs are that was based on the community needs assessment. There was also some work that was done um, during the Human Services Campus uh, exploration a few years ago, and one of the things that they did um, notice or they did talk about is that the need for medical and dental services that was not already planned in the human services was something that was uh, sorely, sorely lacking um, from certain perspectives. Um, so we received four proposals from four um, nonprofit groups and we interviewed them all. The city's uh, pr preferred provider is Health Point and Valley Cities because they are, they are going to be able to provide a holistic um, medical, dental, and behavioral ser health services. And that's really where the healthcare industry is going to, where it's not just about um, your physical health here, your mental health or your, your other uh, health there, it's, it's really integrated among themselves. So this is the, um, again, a quick overview of where we've gone to so far for the Opportunity Center. We um, plan to come back again on the 14th to get more, give you more details. 
and get your uh, direction guidance approval on what types of nonprofit services should we be providing at the TOD site. So as I mentioned, we do, uh, we do have rec re staff recommendation based on the community needs assessment and the strength of the proposal. Um, we are not in complete agreement yet with the development team, uh, I'm sorry, our development team. Um, they believe that it may not be the best fit. We're working very closely with them to figure out how to um, get all of our needs met. There's some additional parking needs, there's an additional infrastructure needs that are necessary for that type of service. Uh, but we believe it's important enough to try to get this type of service that does not currently exist for lower income um, residents here in Issaquah. And then um, the second question, the policy question we'll be asking is, if, are we willing to make any investment or more substantial investment to ensure this type of uh, service exists? And so we uh, will have figures for you by the 14th, but, and, uh, but we're talking about in the seven digit figure number. So we're not talking about $10,000. So, um, but we will have a full analysis of what that would mean. So, there, so remember, if there would be an investment and we would own this, um, we would also have an annual lease payment that we receive from a tenant if we do that. And so we'll make sure to provide all that information to give you a holistic view of that. Questions? Councilmember yes. Winterstein. Thank you, thank you, Jen. Your first bullet there, what nonprofit services? So how, how wide open is that question gonna be when it's posed to us? I mean, you've done an RFP, you have right. a re and you're getting some feedback already from the development side. Um, so how wide open is this yeah. going to be? So we can, yeah, we'll, we'll probably, what we'll probably do is walk through with the RFP and how, the thinking of how we got there. We did do that, do that with the services committee, uh, service and safety last year. I'm not sure how many people were on that from last year, but um, so to give you a quick, uh, got, I don't say guidelines of what we were thinking and to get your reassurance this is where we want to go. So I think it makes a lot of sense to look at what the community needs assessment um, looked at and so to make sure we are on the same page about that. Okay, and so did I, did I hear then with what, um, as you said earlier, uh, staff preferred the Health Point Valley City's proposal. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's one or two, but. It's, it's together but you, as one. But, but it sounds like in going to the developers, you have um, uncovered unforeseen issues when you did the RFP or perhaps? So we had the development team in the interview process. Um, so mm -hmm. they were sitting at the table. And um, and again, so as we looked at what it takes to, to get a medical and dental center, there's a, there's additional investment, there's additional infrastructure that needs to be done in order to get that type of service. It's a little easier just to build a shell and put some office space in. Um, it's a little more, in, um, a little more intense as far as the, the, the details and the needs for a medical dental facility. Okay, so, the, and that's what's spurring all of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, okay. Yep. All right, thank you. So, and I, let, me, let me add to that. Yes. I think this is also a point where, you know, we've, we've talked about this as a potential option. There's, there's a couple other uh, things you could do with that space, but, you know, if the majority of this council said, you know, what we really need there is, some NGO that we don't have in the city that would want to come, uh, you know, that would be part of the conversation, I think, on the 14th, is to understand mm -hmm. if, if uh, you know, there's other options that we're not currently considering that that's some number of the seven of us think we should be looking at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and we and I and and for the interview panel, we also included the chair of the Human Services Commission. So we ha we're very uh, making sure that we have that perspective in there, as well as our staff that's you know aware of the needs in the community. Okay, so I'm at the end. Um, I wanted to see if there was any initial questions, information that you wanted for the 14th, so that again, we can have a robust conversation. We're hoping to move this pretty quickly, again, because we this is part of the decision. Again, this is not the final time we will be, we'll be back here, but um, we this, this decision around our, our desires and our willingness to invest or not um, needs to be made in order us to move forward, the developer to move forward to finalize or move forward on the design and then also do community meetings. We don't wanna go out and, and present something and then say, well, we're just kidding now, we're not gonna do that. Um, but it also, again, has a financial implica implication that we wanna obviously get your approval before we move forward, so. First Council Member Winterstein, then Council Member Ray. 
I've already asked one question. I'll let All right, go. mine's not a question, it's really a request. It would be really helpful if we could see a schedule, since you are moving quickly, of when things are anticipated to happen and when decisions need to be made so that we can get ahead of the decisions instead of being overwhelmed mm -hmm. by them. That mm -hmm. would be very helpful if we mm -hmm. could get that before the 14th. Sure. Thank you. And related to that, I would say um, something that lays out what the public engagement yep. plan is uh, following the 14th. Yep. Other requests? Deputy Council President Batiste. Thank you. Uh, I, I just wanted to echo uh, some options around uh, what would be available for the Opportunity Center, just so it's, it's really laid out. Uh, that we have different options and different mm -hmm. ideas to consider. Sure. But we plan to have some uh, a few scenarios to show you what this means and what this, as far as the costs and the benefits and the pros and cons. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or requests? Councilmember Winterstein? We, uh, we may talk about this more on the 14th, I realize, but you said there's going to be a daycare center, and that's not our concern. You said that there's gonna be a kidney center. I, I assume that means it'll be a place where someone who requires dialysis will be able mm -hmm. to come. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, know, I know both of those are needed. From a, from a um, resident perspective or somebody just from the outside looking in, these are just gonna be three operations. They're all in the, co they're all in the same location. Um, it just so happens this thing we're calling operating, the, excuse me, Opportunity Center is going to be, um, I guess originally we thought uh, the, the, its construction and stand up would have been funded by the developers. Mm -hmm. um, and they are taking care of the daycare. They are taking care of everything that's, that's required. Mm -hmm. um, yes. That's you mentioned true. some special requirements that came up because of the choices we made in, in uh, Health Point and Valley Cities. So everything related to the daycare and the kidney center, not a concern. That currently, um, those are going to go forward. The cities, there's no ask or requirement for the city to. Correct. To, to, okay, it's, so it's only, the it's only the opportunity center because of the selections that we have made. I'm just trying to make, uh, uh. just want to be clear uh, that all of it collectively, daycare, kidney center, and then this thing called the Opportunity Center, they're all gonna be a public benefit. Sure, yes, yes. Okay. So the, um, so you said code. <laughs> so, there, so again, uh, during the development agreement discussions, the negotiations, there will be, there will be some code uh, requests to make some changes or some adjustments to what currently exists p for the design of the building perhaps, or for, um, certain things. So those are not have not all been figured out because we're at a conceptual conceptual design. But um, Spectrum has identified some concerns, and that's again we won't we don't have any authority as staff to say you don't have to do that. We will be having that conversation with council about how that fits into the whole package because we believe that they they are committed to creating a great building that is interactive with the street. And so look at making sure that um, all these pieces work together. Uh, Council Deputy President Batiste. Uh, thanks, Jen. I, I'm just going to reconfirm. I just want to make sure I have this right yeah. in my head. So the Opportunity Center, that's the 10,000 square feet that we're talking about. And then with the Daycare Center and the Kidney Center, that, that covers all of the commercial space in the TOD. Yes. Okay. And I want to I, I want to confirm, if we call the health point in Valley City's uh, configuration, let's call that option B. Um, there's gonna be an option A, which is a, which is a zero cost. Yep. What, what do we get if we don't put any additional money in, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, you're developing that yes. as a scenario. Yes. And so at least those two scenarios will be covered on the 14th. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of to the question of what is a what is a zero net sum option look like, and then what is if if we want the health point in Valley Cities, uh, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. And will you be having also potential uh, funding mechanisms for that uh, health point in Valley Cities option? So we're we are we'll be meeting. So we're already talking to health uh, health point in Valley Cities about what there's a possibility of, of their contribution. We're meeting with the finance director in between this meeting in the May 20, 14th. I'm not sure if I'll have an answer or we may have some general ideas, but um, we're working on that. 
So. They know where there's 965,000. There is. But uh, that's yes. not a seven digit number. So it's really close, though. <laughs> yes. So there are. Yeah, there is one source of, of a resource that we will definitely, you know, mention. Um, but then if there's other things, other ways to get to that point. Again, we'll have that laid out in a nice chart. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions or information people would like for the 14th? Anything yes. else to present? No, that's it. And again, uh, if you ha think of something, you're out, you know, think, uh, brushing your teeth and you think of a great question or information, uh, you know where we are. So we really appreciate you taking the time and we look forward to the 14th discussion. Excellent. I'll ask if anybody in the public wishes to speak this evening. Yes, I'm Hal Ferris with Spectrum Development Solutions, and I, I just want to provide a little bit of clarity around where uh, we aren't in agreement necessarily with staff with the uh, um, Health Point and the Community Health Center. And our, it's not about the use, um, but Health Point in the Community Health Center is not a transit-oriented development use. They require the same amount of parking as they would if they were 10 miles away from the transit station. Their patients, that have sick children or going to the dental don't come by bus. They come in a, their parents' car to go there. So they need a parking ratio that is not compatible with the transit-oriented development use where we have reduced parking. We cannot supply, we can only supply 20 of the 50 parking stalls from a straight out space need that they have. And to provide all that parking would need to be provided somewhere off-site that is still convenient enough to those patients to use it. So that is our primary. The other one we, we have developed uh, for other not-for-profits and are currently developing a, currently a community health center. Uh, those a medical dental use has significantly more plumbing, mechanical ventilation, they have a pharmacy, sterilization rooms, all of those things require greater infrastructure, emergency generator access that aren't required for other commercial uses, all of which have a significant impact on the development cost for the shell that has to service it, as well as our capacity. So those are the things we brought up in the interviews and we brought up and, and really have not got that resolved. So we're here now, we've been essentially dead in the water for six months waiting to get resolutions. So we have lost a lot of time to get past this issue, which now won't come for decision until hopefully the 14th of May. So thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, and with that, uh, we're done with the IDs. I have on the agenda reports on regional activities issues. Is there anyone this evening who wants to bring up a regional activity or issue at this time? I am seeing no one. Uh, with that, our next council meeting is gonna be a regular council meeting on May 7th here in council chambers at 7 p.m. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.